went to Colossae and they actually evangelized and there was a church there and Paul heard about it. And so he was writing these people and trying to encourage them. And uh, he said specifically here in the second chapter that he had great conflict because anytime you get the message secondhand, there is the potential that something might have been left out or maybe something was added to it. And so Paul was concerned and he was writing this book of Colossians to just make sure that they had the basics down pat and understood the foundational truths of Christianity. He didn't want to just take it for granted that they had heard everything. So that's what the whole motive behind the book to Colossians is. And in the first part of this second chapter, he was talking about that in Christ are hidden all of the truths of wisdom and knowledge. And he says, I'm saying these things so that no one will beguile you. And then he begins to list what some of them are. And that leads up to this eighth verse. And in this eighth verse, he says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Now, again, the word philosophy is something that we don't use very much today, and it just applies in most people's thinking to somebody, you know, who was a philosopher back uh, before the time of Christ or something like that, and they don't think that they have a philosophy. Every one of us has a philosophy, and I'm going to be explaining this in a lot more detail. But let me first of all just go into some of these words here in this eighth verse. When it says, Beware, if you trace the entomology of that word back, it literally goes back to the Old English, and it means be war is where, where it comes from. Be at war. This is a warning on Paul's part that we need to be on guard. We need to be aware that we are under attack. And I tell you, this is one of the things that has caused so many problems in the body of Christ. Uh, they have been asleep. They have been just enjoying their time in church and reveling in what Jesus has done for us. And they haven't been engaged in the cultural war. The church has basically retreated to within the church walls and they haven't recognized that we are at war, that there is a spirit of antichrist out there and there is demonic powers that's trying to destroy not only our souls, but also the freedom that was bought for us in this nation. Now, this program is heard all around the world and I'm aware that there's people in, you know, we have 5.2 billion people around the world that could see this program. So I'm aware that not everybody watching uh, is in the United States and has the freedoms that we've enjoyed. But this nation, the United States, and many of the nations that people are watching this program in, there, there is godly principles that have actually granted us a lot of freedom. And Satan hates everything to do with God and is coming against every godly principle that this nation or any nation was established upon. He is for nothing but chaos and ungodliness. And we have been at war, but because the church wasn't aware that we were at war, we haven't been engaged. And because of it, we see our freedoms being taken away from us. We see immorality going to a realm that, I mean, it is just unthinkable. You know, 10 years ago, I don't think that most people could have even predicted that we would be where we are today. It is like there has been an explosion of ungodliness and morals have been set aside. You know, uh, marriage now can be between two men, two women. It won't be long if we don't turn things around, which I believe we're going to. And I, I'm praying and believing God for a great move of God that is going to change things. But if things didn't change the direction they're going, they will allow marriage between an adult and a child, between a person and an animal. Those kind of things have happened before. They're written about in the Bible. And this is where everything's headed. And there's a lot of people watching this like, oh, no, that'll never happen. Ten years ago, nobody would have ever thought that we would be seeing all the transgenderism and giving hormone blockers and sex reassignment surgery to children as young as four, five, six years old. Nobody would have ever believed that. I'm telling you, this is what Satan wants to do. He wants to just totally destroy, and yet many Christians aren't aware that we are in a war. They go through their day just, in a sense, uh, totally oblivious to what's going on around them. 
all of the homelessness that we see, the drug addiction that we see, the sexual immorality, the perversion, the uh, pornography that is just, this is a, an attack not only on the United States, it's an attack on civilization. It's attack against anything having foundations and morality and putting limits on the ungodliness that people like to do. And uh, sad to say, all of these restrictions are being removed, and it's because the church hasn't realized we've been at war. Did you know the same thing has happened many, many times in just the secular realm, talking about not anything spiritual to do with it, but like in World War II, the United States was trying to stay out of World War II, and they were just refusing to be engaged. Matter of fact, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt actually ran uh, on a platform that he would not get involved in the European war. And of course, all that changed on December the 7th, 1941, when Pearl Harbor was attacked by the Japanese and we were drug into the war. But prior to that time, people were just trying to ignore what was going on in the rest of the world. And they allowed Hitler to gain tremendous, tremendous assets and uh, all of these things that he used against us. You know, it was Winston Churchill that said that World War II was the most preventable war in the history of the world because Hitler was a nobody and had no power and authority, and yet uh, Chamberlain, the Prime Minister of Britain, and uh, France and other people, they did not want to get repeat a war. They had just come out of World War I, and they were so anti-war that they allowed Hitler to invade Austria and Poland and others with no resistance whatsoever, and he gained all of their assets, their military hardware and people and things like this, and he could have been stopped early on, but they would not engage. They refused to be at war. I say all of these things that I've said to say that in the same way, in those ways that we can see these things in the natural realm, did you know the same thing is true in the spiritual realm, that the church has not realized that we have an enemy that goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I think that's 1 Peter 5, 8. And the church has basically just been trying to ignore this and just enjoy their lives. And to a degree, I can understand this, that Jesus has set us free. We are in the world, but we aren't of the world. And so in some ways, we can detach from the things that the ungodly have to be occupied with, and we can think about heaven, and we can think about who we are in Christ and what we have, and we can rejoice in those things even when the world is going to hell in a handbasket. I can understand that to a degree, but the Lord also told us that we are the salt and the light of the earth. And Paul right here is telling these believers to beware, be at war, to recognize that we have an enemy who's out to steal, to kill, and to destroy, John chapter 10, verse 10. So he's telling them, you need to be on guard. You know, I was in Vietnam, and I've heard it said before that war is long periods of total boredom interspersed by moments of absolute terror. And that really kind of describes war. I remember being in Vietnam that we would go long stretches of time without any engagement of the enemy. I wasn't out in the field as a soldier. I was on a fire support base. It was a remote fire support base. And we were under attack and we were completely surrounded by the NVA and like on my 21st birthday, I took 21 direct mortar hits on this bunker that I had built. And you could see muzzle fire from the enemy, but that was really seldom. Most of the time we were there and it was just boring day after day. And because of this, I pulled bunker guard every night. I was a chaplain's assistant. I wasn't assigned directly to the battalion headquarters. I was assigned to the brigade headquarters. And so in a sense, I didn't have to do what all of the other people on that base did. But out of boredom, I volunteered to do bunker guard every night, uh, you know, in case we were attacked. And I remember doing bunker guard that the average person would come there and they would just go to sleep. They wouldn't even, you know, we had four hour watches 
and the average person would go to sleep. And there's lots of times that I pulled not only my bunker guard, but I'd pull two or three other people because they wouldn't even, they weren't taking it serious. And it, you would think, why would a person do that when you're engaged in a war? But I mean, there was people that they just, we went so many days and weeks without anything happened that they got lazy and they were not on guard. And I tell you, it was uh, potentially disastrous. And I've seen that in war situation. I certainly am saying that I see this among Christians, that the most Christians are not recognizing we are at war. Now, I'm not saying these things to cause fear in people because if we engage and if we just use the weapons that have been given unto us, well, then we are guaranteed to win. We are more than a conqueror. Jesus has already won, and all we've got to do is just stand in that victory. But I guarantee you, Satan is still coming against us. And if you are ignorant of the fact that we are in a war, all that means is you, you can't stop the fact that Satan is out seeking whom he may devour. It's not going to change that. All it means is if you're ignorant of the war and if you aren't preparing yourself and if you aren't on guard, all it means is that you're just going to lose this war, that Satan is going to steal from you. And this is what it goes on to say. It says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. The word spoil here isn't talking about how like meat spoils or fruit spoils you know, through airborne particles and things like that. This is talking spoil like in a battle. You go out and fight your enemy and you, you kill your enemy and then you take the spoils. You strip them of everything that's of value. And this is what it's talking about. Beware lest Satan strip you of the treasures, the values, the things that God has provided for you. Boy, this is so applicable to us today. There are Christians today who is letting Satan steal their health from them. They don't understand that by the stripes of Jesus, we were healed. And over in uh, Exodus chapter 23, I believe it's verse 25, it says that he will bless your bread and water and I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. The word take and away is the exact same word on either side of the word sickness. And the word means to turn off. I literally believe that Jesus has purchased our healing and you don't even have to get sick. Not only can you be healed if you are sick, but you don't even have to get sick. Now, I'm not going to teach on healing right now, but I believe that that's part of what Jesus provided for us. And I would say that the vast majority, well over 50% of the body of Christ has let Satan spoil them of that treasure. You know, in my meetings, I'll often give an invitation and I'll ask if you've got sickness or something like that to stand up or to raise their hand. And it's not unusual to have 70, 80% of Christians talk about sickness, disease that they're dealing with. Again, I'm not condemning them, but I'm saying that that's letting Satan spoil you because that is not the way that God intended it to be. Over in James chapter 5, it says, Is any sick among you? Let them call for the elders of the church and pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith will save the sick. Did you know if you went to the average church today and said, Man, I've got a doctor's report. I'm dying of cancer or I've got some incurable whatever. And if you went to the average church and asked them to anoint you with oil and pray over you, they wouldn't do it. They would say, well, why, have you been to the doctor? Why don't you take this medicine? Why don't you go get this surgery? The average Christian church today does not believe in healing, or if they do believe in healing, they believe God can do it, but it's totally at His will. They don't have any understanding that by the stripes of Jesus, we were healed, and if you aren't seeing healing, it's not God who hadn't given, it's us that hadn't received. And the average person doesn't understand that. And so Satan is spoiling them, stealing from them, and taking their help. You could go into the same thing about prosperity. The average Christian is struggling when the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, that you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might be made rich. And the average person today, the average Christian today will say, that's not talking about financially rich. 
Well, it is, because if you take that scripture in context, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, every single verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9, I think there's a total of 39 verses, every single verse in those two chapters is talking about money. You read it, and you would have to be dishonest to say it's not talking about money. So for you to take 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 and say when it says that he became poor so that you might be made rich, and you say that's not talking about money, that's only talking about emotional, it's talking about in our relationships, it's talking about spiritual things, but it's not talking about financial things. Well, then that's dishonest. I've said this before, but if you take the text out of its context, then all you have left is a con. And people who sit there and are saying 2 Corinthians 8 9 is not talking about financial prosperity, you are not honest with Scripture. That is a con. That's a deception. Either you've been deceived or you're seeking to deceive other people. So I say all of these things to say that just like Paul said, beware, you're at war, so go on guard duty. Look for the enemy. Be prepared so that he doesn't come and spoil you, strip you of what Jesus has provided for you. And you could just keep making applications. It says in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus. Peace is a tremendous thing that God has given us. And yet there's many Christians that have been spoiled. Satan is stripping from them and taking from them the peace that God has given them. Galatians 5, and 23 says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. All of those things have been given to us. They are all a product of our salvation, and we are supposed to be bearing fruit constantly, and yet the average Christian has had Satan strip them, spoil them of these things that Jesus provided. Man, what I'm saying, I know that there are many of you watching this that you, you don't doubt that Jesus wants us to have that, but if you were to be honest, are you walking in health? Are you walking in prosperity? Are you walking in joy and love and peace and temperance and faith and all of these things? There are millions of people watching this program right now that you know that Jesus provided these things, but you aren't experiencing them let me just say to you, what's happened is you haven't been on guard. You have had Satan spoil you. He has stripped you of something that Jesus provided for you. And how did it happen? It says here, through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. You know, it says in Mark chapter 7, verse 13, Jesus was speaking, and he says, your traditions and doctrines of men make the Word of God of no effect. There are people watching this that you have had Satan spoil you, and how did it happen? Through philosophy, vain deceit, traditions, and doctrines of men. And you don't realize it, but as a person thinks in their heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7. You don't like what you're experiencing, and you're praying and asking God to change it, but you haven't made the connection that it's not prayer that's going to change your situation. It's changing the way you think. You've got to change the way you think. You've got to change your philosophy. Welcome to our Tuesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing a teaching that I just started yesterday talking about Christian philosophy. I have a book on this that I wrote 20 or 30 years ago, and the first part of this book is kind of theological, talking about the very things I talked about yesterday and we'll be talking about today. But then the second half of this book goes into how we should look at things in our culture today. And it's kind of a reference deal. I actually have pictures in here, color pictures that illustrate the things I'm talking about. And I deal with creation, I deal with abortion, and I deal with homosexuality, and I have charts and graphs, pictures, and things. We are asking for a donation of some amount for this. This is a 280-page uh, book, but then we have this little uh, booklet that we're calling Observing All Things, and this has some of the same material in the second part, some of the same pictures, some of the same graphs and things, and this is a freebie offer to you. This is just a small portion of what this book covers, 
But then we have CDs, DVDs, a study guide, and other things. And we'll give out information about this at the end of the program. Yesterday, I was using Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, where it says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. And basically, what I was doing was just saying that uh, Paul here was warning us to be on guard. That's what the word beware means. It comes from be at war. And we need to be on guard against the enemy lest he spoil us. This isn't talking about spoil like fruit spoils. This is talking about don't let them strip you of what Jesus has provided. And I spent all yesterday basically introducing this subject and saying that the reason that the church is in the situation it's in today and the reason that we are impotent and not making a greater impact on our society today is because we haven't been on guard. We have let Satan spoil us, and the average Christian is limping through life, not accepting and enjoying the fullness of what Jesus has provided. And because of it, we aren't an attractive witness for the Lord. Who wants to be like the average Christian today who's just as sick, just as poor, just as scared, just as miserable, and most of the time not near as happy as the unbelievers. There is pleasure in sin for a season, and, and the average Christian isn't even enjoying that. They aren't enjoying the things of the Lord, and they aren't enjoying the pleasures of sin. And so because of it, we aren't being the salt and the light that God intended us to be. So that's what I covered yesterday. Today I want to talk about this word philosophy. And the word literally is talking about a way of thinking. Most people don't use this word philosophy today. Those who even think about these kind of things, they might use the term worldview. You know, I wrote this book 25 years ago or something like that, and I put these three areas that I dealt with, creation versus evolution, and abortion and homosexuality like 25 years ago, but it's just a kind of a minor uh, explanation of those things. Now I have what we call a biblical worldview series, and I have a biblical worldview foundation series that is 12 hours of teaching just by me on different subjects. One of those is creation versus evolution. And then uh, we have a biblical worldview on nothing but sexuality, and I have a bunch of my friends, E.W. Jackson, Dwayne Sheriff, just a lot of different people that contributed towards this. And we have, I think it's about 15 hours worth of teaching on what the Bible has to say about what, what godly morality and sexuality is life. And then we have one on racism. We have one on uh, Marxism or socialism. And these are just exposés in depth by multiple people dealing with these things. You go to our website, awmi.net, and you could get information on that. But anyway, my point in saying all of that is now I've developed this in much more detail. But this was a teaching from 25 or 30 years ago that basically dealt with the same principles, just not in the same depth. And what this is talking about is that philosophy is a way of thinking, not individual thoughts, but it's a paradigm. It's a worldview. It's a lens that we look at the world through, and everything that comes at us, we evaluate it through that lens. Now, most people don't really recognize that you have a philosophy. You probably haven't used that word, but you do. You know, I remember going over to Poland, and this was before the Berlin Wall came down. This was in the early 1980s, and they were still under com communism. And I remember going over there, and everywhere I went, I mean, people just would immediately say, an American. Uh, I went into places that people outside of the Soviet Union didn't go to. It was remote. And uh, anyway, I just stood out. I had a, uh, sometimes I would wear a cowboy hat, <laughs> which was, totally out of place. I had a big old belt buckle, and I wore my boots and stuff, and it was obvious. But anyway, I wanted to blend in, so I went and borrowed clothes from the guy who was my interpreter, and I put on totally his clothes. And as far as I could tell, I, was, I looked exactly like them. I was wearing their shoes, their, his clothes, everything. 
And I went out and stood on a street corner, and within five minutes, I had a crowd around me going, American, American. And I never said a word. I knew if I started talking, everybody would know that I was an American. And anyway, I asked this Polish guy that I was with, I said, how do these people recognize that I'm American? He says, it's your attitude. He didn't use the word philosophy, but he says, it's your attitude. And I said, how, do, how does my attitude come across when I don't even say a word? He says, you're free. He says, people, this was under the Soviet Union in the early 1980s. He says, we've learned that you never look at a person eye to eye. You know, the Bible says that the eye is the uh, window of the soul. And people that were under communism, they didn't look people to eye to eye because it could be a KGB agent. It could be somebody who's trying to check them out. So you always glance down. You always look down. You had a body language that, in a sense, showed your submission. You never walked with your head up. You didn't look at people eye to eye. You didn't smile at anybody. And you certainly didn't act happy. And, you know, once he began to start telling me these things, I started looking. And sure enough, there was a body language that people had been taught to be subjected and to be beat down and things. And, and I was just standing there smiling at people as they came by. And I was looking at people eye to eye. And I was standing there and I, I just looked free. Did you know you have an attitude whether you know it or not? And I realized when I was over there that people that we consider homeless today and that we would consider that they're in bad situation, you take them and put them in some of those communist countries. And again, you know, the Soviet Union now doesn't exist. But if you put them back into a situation like that where just for the wrong look, the wrong statement, you could be put in prison, you could be sent to Siberia or something like that, you took an average homeless person in the U.S. and put them over there, they would be they would be considered free and uh, liberated compared to the average person that was under that. It was a philosophy, and it affected the way they walked, the way they talked, the way they interacted with people, did everything. I'm saying all this to say that you may not recognize it, but you have a philosophy. You have a way of looking at things. You know, being an optimist is a philosophy. Being a pessimist is a philosophy. And there may be people saying, well, I'm a pessimist because of all these negative things that happen. I'm not sitting there saying that there aren't negative things that happen, and I'm not saying that people don't have bad attitudes and stuff, and there's reasons why that happens. But nonetheless, once you get an offense, and once you've been hurt, and once you've been abused, unless you receive the freedom that's in Christ, it will cause you to have a philosophy where you just don't trust anybody where you expect things to always be bad. You just become a pessimist. I actually had a woman who worked for me one time who was married to a man, and he just physically, sexually, every way, abused her verbally in every way. And because of it, she got a divorce, but she had a chip on her shoulder, and she hated men. And I mean, if she came in and if you said, well, you look nice today, she would sue you for sexual harassment. And we actually had her sue some of our employees who didn't do a thing wrong, but she just had a paradigm, a way of looking at things, a philosophy that she had been hurt and she thought that every male was out to hurt her and she couldn't get along with anybody. And I could just keep giving examples and example, example of this. You know, we have the saying that hurt people hurt people. And if you have been hurt, and if you haven't let Jesus rid you of that and change you of that, you will wind up having a philosophy and you wind up uh, becoming the person that you hate. There's so many people that, you know, go through an abusive marriage and then they go and get remarried and they go pick a person that's just like the one who abused them. It's a philosophy. It's a way of thinking. And there are people that are trapped in these terrible situations and they're praying and asking God to change it and they're looking for something from the outside to change. But change doesn't come from the outside. Change comes from the inside. You have to be set free on the inside. And this is what so many people are missing. What Paul is saying right here is just so important for us today 
that we need to be on guard because Satan is trying to spoil us, strip us of what Jesus has done, and the way he does it is through philosophy. Philosophy is not just individual thoughts. It's a way of thinking. It's a paradigm. It's connecting all of the dots. You know, there's a lot of Christians that have heard the scripture, 1 Peter 2, 24, by his stripes we were healed. Isaiah 53, where it says, by his stripes we are healed. And they, they know these scriptures and they can quote it. And so because of that, they may desire healing, but they still think sick. They have a philosophy of sickness. I've prayed with a lot of people who've been sick for so long, they just think sick. And did you know, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, Proverbs 23, 7. And so if, you, if your whole life, if you've been sick a long period of time, did you know you get to where you dream sick, you think sick, you plan sick. When you go on a vacation, you take all of your medication, you think about, am I going to be in a place where I can get my prescriptions refilled? Am I going to be in a place where there's allergies? Am I going to be in a place where if something happens, I'll be have access to emergency medical treatment and stuff? And I know some of you may be shocked that I'm saying this, but if you just see sickness as your identity and that's the way you think and your whole life revolves around it, you're going to stay sick. You've got to see yourself well before you see yourself well. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Mark chapter 11, verse 24 says, Whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. And yet, see, there's a lot of people that have an individual truth that by the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. And so they pray, but they don't ever see themselves well. They didn't see that they received it. And so they continue to act sick. They continue to act poor. They continue to go around with the hurt and the pain that they've experienced. They never change their philosophy, their way of thinking, and yet they want to experience different results. I think it was Einstein that said, it's a definition of insanity to do the same thing and expect different results. I could tweak that a little bit and say it this way. It's a definition of insanity to continue to think the same way and expect different results. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7. So you've got to change your philosophy. And this is how Satan gains access to us is through a wrong philosophy, a wrong way of thinking, a wrong paradigm, a wrong worldview, a wrong way of looking at things. This is how he gains access to us. He cannot do anything to you without your consent and cooperation. And I know that that statement is offensive to a lot of people, but if you understand it correctly, it's actually a wonderful statement. It's wonderful because if Satan is limited, that somehow or another he has to gain access to us through the way we think, well, then that means that if we would keep our mind stayed upon the Lord, Isaiah 26, 3, the Lord would keep us in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him. That means that if we just bring every thought into captivity and under obedience to Christ, the way it talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5, then Satan would have no access to us. For those who've got problems in their life and they don't want to accept responsibility and they are, they are glorying in the fact that they are being, uh, you know, controlled and they are sitting there and just, they're, they're taking comfort in the fact that it's not my fault. It's not my fault. Other people have made me the way I am. It's my dysfunctional family. It's the fact that this person did this to me. It's the color of my skin. It's a lack of my education. It's my gender. And we have all of these reasons for being uh, taken advantage of, and we use them as excuses. People like that are going to be very offended by what I'm saying because I'm saying that nothing from without makes you the way you are unless you accept that philosophy, that way of thinking. If you were to take the philosophy, the way of thinking that the Bible produces, you could be a winner in every single situation. 
And there's people that will take offense at that well, because they are glorying in the fact that it's not my fault. They don't want to take any responsibility. They're saying, you're condemning me. I'm not condemning you. I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the Word of God. Jesus said that you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And it's only the truth you know that makes you free. You are always going to be a victim and not a victor if you think that you have no control and it's your color of your skin, it's your lack of education, it's your gender, it's your, you know, all of these different things. You're always going to be a victim until you start recognizing that nothing from without can destroy me. I've got a choice whether I become bitter or better. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. If you get your philosophy, your way of thinking correct, you can break any chain. You can break anything that Satan has put upon your life. Amen. So again, people who are glorying in the fact that I'm a victim, you will be offended by this because it's taking away your defenses. It's putting responsibility on you. I'm not to say that you don't have problems that were maybe pushed upon you. There are prejudices against people over their sex, over their color, over all kinds of things. But there are so many examples of people that have overcome all of those prejudices and have been able to succeed. I'm not saying that there aren't prejudices, that there aren't factors without, that there aren't pressures that come against you. But I'm saying nothing can make you live as a victim unless you accept that mindset. If you get the proper philosophy, the proper way of thinking, you can break out of anything. There is no restrictions that can hold you back. And again, there's people offended by that, but it's meant to encourage you. There's some people watching this that I guarantee you the truth is setting you free. You've just felt like, what's the use? I can't help it. This is who I am. I was sexually abused when I was a kid, and so I'm just going to limp through life. No, that's not so. You can be totally set free from that. You know, I was just meditating today where it says in Isaiah chapter 54 that you will forget the shame of your widowhood and you won't remember it anymore. You can literally be delivered of anything that has come against you. You can be set free. Now, this puts some responsibility on you but it's really not your responsibility. It's your response to His ability. If you would respond positively, if you would take the Word of God, if you would renew your mind and establish a Christian philosophy, a Christian way of looking at things that have come against you, then I promise you, as a man thinks in his heart, that's the way it'll be. You can literally get set free. Your life is going the direction of your dominant thought. And I know that, again, this is offensive to so many people because your life is a total mess. Maybe your marriage is a wreck, your finances are a wreck, your health is a wreck, and you're thinking, no, it's not my fault. I didn't have anything to do with this. Well, again, I'm not saying that you go out and pursue a broken marriage and you don't pursue uh, poverty and you don't pursue sickness. It's not like you're saying, I want these things. But your thinking has been wrong. You haven't understood what Jesus has made available to you and how that you can overcome all things, how that He always makes us triumph in Christ Jesus. You haven't thought that way and because you have seen yourself as just a mere human being and you don't have any power against sickness, against poverty, against these things. See, that's not true. I'm not only human. One third of me is wall to wall Holy Ghost. If I'm born again, if you're born again, then you have God living on the inside of you. And if you were to change your philosophy, your way of thinking, you could literally break whatever has come against you. And I'm not saying that we don't have problems that come from the outside, but I'm saying they couldn't get on the inside of you unless they pass your thinking. If you were to see that, no, by the stripes of Jesus, I was healed, Exodus chapter 23, verse 25, He has turned off sickness, taken sickness away from the midst of me, and that I am not going to get sick. If you had that kind of thinking, that then Satan, sickness couldn't penetrate past your thinking and get into your body. I'm saying some radical things, and I know that people think I'm weird, but I think you're weird to have all of these benefits 
THAT GOD HAS PROVIDED FOR US, AND YET WE ARE LIVING SO SUBSTANDARD. IT SAYS IN GALATIANS CHAPTER 1, VERSE 4, THAT JESUS GAVE HIMSELF FOR OUR SINS TO DELIVER US FROM THIS PRESENT EVIL WORLD, NOT JUST THE ONE TO COME, BUT WE ARE SUPPOSED TO HAVE VICTORY NOW. JESUS EVEN SAID TO PRAY, THY WILL BE DONE ON EARTH AS IT IS IN HEAVEN. IN HEAVEN THERE ISN'T SICKNESS, THERE ISN'T POVERTY, THERE ISN'T SORROW, THERE ISN'T GRIEF. YOU CAN LIVE A VICTORIOUS LIFE, BUT IT'S GOING TO HAVE TO START WITH YOU CHANGING THE WAY YOU THINK. IF YOU THINK THAT ALL YOU ARE IS SAVED AND STUCK, AND YOU JUST HAVE TO MUDDLE THROUGH DOWN HERE, AND IT'S WHEN WE ALL GET TO HEAVEN THAT WHAT A DAY THAT'S GOING TO BE. IN THE SWEET BY AND BY, IT'S GOING TO BE AWESOME. WELL, YOU CAN ALSO HAVE STEAK ON THE PLATE WHILE YOU WAIT. AMEN. YOU DON'T HAVE TO WAIT UNTIL JUST A SWEET BY AND BY. IF YOU WOULD RENEW YOUR MIND AND GET A CHRISTIAN PHILOSOPHY, YOU COULD START WALKING IN VICTORY TODAY. AGAIN, I'M NOT SAYING THAT YOU'LL NEVER HAVE A PROBLEM, BUT I'M SAYING YOU CAN OVERCOME THOSE PROBLEMS. THOSE PROBLEMS CAN'T GET ON THE INSIDE OF YOU AND DOMINATE YOU UNLESS YOU ALLOW IT THROUGH YOUR STINKING THINKING. WELCOME TO OUR WEDNESDAY'S BROADCAST OF THE GOSPEL TRUTH. TODAY I'M CONTINUING TO TALK ABOUT A SUBJECT THAT I'VE ENTITLED CHRISTIAN PHILOSOPHY. AND I HAVE THIS LITTLE BOOKLET ENTITLED OBSERVING ALL THINGS. ORIGINALLY THIS WAS ACTUALLY A PART OF THIS TEACHING, AND IT WAS JUST A LITTLE BOOKLET THAT TOOK SOME OF THE GRAPHS AND THE PICTURES THAT WERE IN THE SECOND HALF OF THIS BOOK AND MADE IT AVAILABLE SO THAT PEOPLE COULD REFERENCE IT QUICKLY. I'M OFFERING THIS AS A FREE GIFT TO YOU, AND I BELIEVE THIS WOULD BE A REAL BLESSING. THIS IS A 280-PAGE BOOK THAT THE FIRST HALF OF IT IS KIND OF JUST THEOLOGICAL ABOUT HOW IMPORTANT IT IS THE WAY YOU THINK. AND THEN THE SECOND HALF APPLIES THIS TO CREATION VERSUS EVOLUTION, ABORTION, AND THEN ALSO HOMOSEXUALITY. AND SO THE SECOND HALF IS KIND OF A REFERENCE BOOK, AND THERE'S PICTURES, COLOR PICTURES, GRAPHS, AND THINGS LIKE THIS IN HERE. THIS IS A 280-PAGE BOOK. WE ARE ASKING FOR A GIFT OF SOME AMOUNT TO COVER THAT. THIS LITTLE BOOKLET IS OUR FREE GIFT TO YOU. AND THEN WE HAVE USBs, CDS, DVDs, AND EVEN A STUDY GUIDE THAT GOES ALONG WITH IT. THIS WORD PHILOSOPHY IS NOT A WORD THAT WE USE OFTEN TODAY, AND THAT'S THE REASON THAT I'VE KEPT IT. IT'S A WORD THAT'S USED IN uh, COLOSSIANS CHAPTER 2, VERSE 8. AND BECAUSE IT'S NOT USED VERY MUCH, MOST PEOPLE KIND OF DRAW A BLANK WHEN YOU TALK ABOUT A PHILOSOPHY. THEY AREN'T CLEAR ON WHAT THAT MEANS. AND SO THAT ALLOWS ME TO DEFINE IT. AND THAT'S THE REASON THAT I LIKE USING CHRISTIAN PHILOSOPHY SO THAT IT DOESN'T uh, DRAW A PERSON'S ATTENTION TO SOME WRONG UNDERSTANDING OF THIS. WHAT THIS BASICALLY IS TALKING ABOUT IS THE WAY YOU THINK. TODAY WE WOULD SAY A WORLD VIEW, A PARADIGM, A LENS THROUGH WHICH YOU LOOK AT THINGS WITH. DID YOU KNOW IF YOU ARE JUST BITTER AND HURT AND ANGRY, AND IF THAT'S THE WAY THAT YOU'VE BEEN, AND IF YOU ARE NURTURING THIS AND HOLDING ON TO THAT, WELL, THEN IT'S LIKE LOOKING AT THE WORLD THROUGH LIKE A GLASS. IF YOU HAD A RED COLORED GLASS OR SOMETHING, AND IF YOU HELD IT UP, THEN EVERYTHING YOU SEE IS GOING TO BE uh, INFLUENCED BY THAT. IT'S GOING TO BE RED. IT'S GOING TO HAVE SOME SHADE OF RED ON IT. IF YOU LOOK THROUGH A BLUE GLASS, IT WOULD LOOK THAT WAY. IF YOU ARE LOOKING AT THE WORLD THROUGH A PARADIGM, A PHILOSOPHY, THAT IS INCORRECT, IT'S GOING TO SKEW EVERYTHING YOU DO. AND DID YOU KNOW THIS IS EXACTLY WHAT'S HAPPENING IN OUR WORLD TODAY. THERE ARE PEOPLE THAT HAVE A TOTAL UNGODLY PHILOSOPHY TO WHERE THEY DO NOT ACKNOWLEDGE THE EXISTENCE OF GOD. THEY DON'T ACKNOWLEDGE THE STANDARDS THAT GOD'S WORD PUTS OUT. AND BECAUSE OF IT, THEY THINK THAT THEY ARE GOD, THAT THEY CAN DECIDE WHAT THEY WANT TO DO. AND SO THEY CAN CHOOSE TO BE A MALE OR A FEMALE TODAY, AND THEY CAN GO BACK AND FORTH, AND THEY CAN JUST SLEEP AROUND. THEY CAN HAVE MULTIPLE PARTNERS. THEY CAN MARRY A MAN. A MAN CAN MARRY A MAN. A WOMAN CAN MARRY A WOMAN. Uh, ALL OF THOSE ARE PHILOSOPHIES AND MINDSETS. YOU KNOW, IN PSALMS CHAPTER 36, VERSE 1, THE SCRIPTURE SAYS THAT THE TRANSGRESSION OF THE WICKED SAYS WITHIN MY HEART THAT THERE IS NO FEAR OF GOD BEFORE THEIR EYES. DID YOU KNOW IF YOU HAD A FEAR OF GOD, YOU CAN DEFINE FEAR IN A COUPLE OF DIFFERENT WAYS. YOU CAN DEFINE IT AS TERROR, uh, FEAR OF PUNISHMENT, FEAR OF REJECTION, BUT YOU CAN ALSO DEFINE FEAR AS A REVERENCE. EVEN WHEN WE'RE BORN AGAIN AND ARE, are NO LONGER COMING UNDER THE PUNISHMENT AND THE JUDGMENT OF GOD, WE SHOULD STILL REVERENCE AND HONOR GOD. 
But people that have no fear of God, whether it's a fear of being held accountable and being punished or whether it's a reverence and a love or respect for God, people that have no fear of God, are that's the reason they're living ungodly. That's exactly what Psalms chapter 36, verse 1 says. The transgression of the wicked says within my heart there is no fear of God before. If people feared God, they wouldn't do the things that they're doing. You know, we have people that go in today and have mass shootings and they kill people and then they kill themselves thinking that I've got by with it, that they can't prosecute me. They don't fear God. They don't believe that there's life after life. They don't understand that someday we're going to stand before God and we're going to be held accountable for what we've done. And people that go out and kill people and then kill themselves thinking that they have escaped punishment, they have just ushered themselves into a Christless eternity where they will be punished for all eternity. See, if they had a fear of God, if they believed what the teaching of the Word of God says, people would never act that way. So your actions are controlled by the way you think. Proverbs 23, 7, As he thinks in his heart, so is he. Your life is going the direction of your dominant thought. I'm not saying it's going the direction of your dominant desire, your dominant prayer. You could be praying for things. You could be desiring things, but they aren't going to come to pass if you're thinking wrong in your heart. This is how Satan comes against us, is through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of man, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. You know, there's only two other times that the word philosopher or philosophy is used in the Bible, and this is in Acts chapter 17. And let me just read this to you. It's, it's not the word philosophy. It's the word philosopher. It says in verse 17, Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, What will this babbler say? Other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. So this is the only other time that that word is used in Scripture, and it's talking about these philosophers who were the Epicureans and the Stoics. You know, this is talking about in a marketplace. Uh, it was customary that when people went to the market that there was people that would stand there and they would preach their philosophy. And one was named after a man named Epicurus. You know, I could give you the exact uh, uh, time of Epicurus' life. It's in my living commentary. If anybody wants to get these details, uh, my living commentary is a digital commentary that I've written on over 27,000 verses in the Bible. And it'll give you the exact details. I don't have that on the top of my head right now. But anyway, Epicurus was a person who lived a couple of hundred years prior to the time of Jesus, and he had a philosophy that if there was a God, he was disconnected from anything we do. And it was like, you know, what we would call the deist of the early 1700s were kind of like the Epicureans that God just created the world and then wound it up like a clock and it was running and he had no interaction with people. He didn't control any events that ever happened. And basically you weren't accountable to him. Yes, he created us, but it's up to you to be whoever you want to be and live however you want to. And so the Epicureans just indulged every lust, every desire. There was no restrictions on them no morality whatsoever. You could do anything you wanted to. It was all about feelings. If it feels good, do it. We may not call it the same thing today, but boy, that is prevalent today. There's a lot of people that they, they just believe that if there is a God, He's totally disconnected and we aren't going to be answerable to Him and they just live any way they want to. That's a philosophy. That was the philosophy of the Epicureans and then the philosophy of the Stoics. The word Stoic came from the word Stoa, the Greek word Stoa, and that's what you call a porch. And around the marketplace, it was in an area of the city, and there would be these buildings around there, and there would be these balconies or, or, or porches. And people would stand up there, and they would spout their philosophy. And so the Stoics, 
It was named after these people that stood on these porches uh, over the marketplace and would give their deal. And Stoics were people who believed just the opposite of the Epicureans. Instead of believing that um, you could do anything you want to and that there was no consequences and that there's no accountability to a God or anything like that, the Stoics were people that believed all emotion was wrong and that you just had to control your emotions. You were to show no emotion. It, you know, it would be similar today to people um, that watch Star Trek and science fiction movies and um, uh, who is it? Spock. I'm not a great science fiction guy, but Spock is a person who just controlled his emotions and had none. That was a stoic. Matter of fact, today we will say about a person who doesn't show very much emotion, we will call him stoic. That goes back to this philosophy of these people who were preaching that, you know, all emotions are bad. You got to restrain emotions and never indulge emotions. Those are all philosophies. So there are some people that see, see today, we have it in a little different wrapper, but it's basically the same thing. There are some people that believe that it's all about just do whatever feels good. They have no restrictions on their actions. They are totally out of control. And even some Christians, uh, they have a version of this. Uh, they may not go into immorality, but when it comes to praising God, they just are trying to achieve some kind of a thing to where they are just overwhelmed with emotion and they are constantly seeking some high, some fix in, the, in their relationship with the Lord. Did you know that that's not really what the Scripture teaches? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And there's a lot of people that they don't want faith. They want to feel something. They want to see it. They want to have some kind of special and, and experience. They can't pray without crying. They think that if they can't cry, if they can't reach some emotional high, then they haven't really connected with the Lord. There's a partial truth there, and there's something certainly not not the stoic attitude where you have no emotion. That's not what I'm saying, but it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be these wild extremes where you have these super highs and then these super lows that people go through. And so anyway, there's some people see that have this philosophy that I'm not really connecting with the Lord unless I'm feeling something, unless there's goosebumps going up and down my spine, unless I'm hearing angels sing. That's a philosophy. And did you know it'll lead you into trouble? If you study people in the Bible, like for instance, Elijah was a man who was mightily used to God, called fire down out of heaven on more than one occasion, saw the widow's son raised from the dead, ended the drought, and did all kinds of awesome, awesome things. Did you know that in his entire lifetime, and we don't know exactly how long it was, but it was decades, probably three or four decades of ministry, there's only eight recorded miracles in his life. And some people see these miracles and they think that, man, that's the way it's got to be every day. In Elijah's life, as far as scripture goes, there was only eight recorded miracles over maybe 40 years. That means about once every five years or something, he had something miraculous happen. The rest of the time, he was just walking with God by faith. Some people miss this, see, and they think that every day has got to be something special. If, the, if God was to answer their prayer, they go into prayer and they just, oh God, I want to feel you. Oh God, I want to experience you. And if God was to do something special, if an angel showed up, if you saw a vision, if you heard an audible voice, if something miraculous happened, it would ruin most people because then the next day you would think, God, it's got to be greater today. And if you didn't experience something special that day, then you would think, what's wrong with me? Is God displeased with me? You need, need to get to a place to where you just enjoy hanging out with the Lord and He doesn't have to perform. He doesn't have to be jumping through a hoop. He doesn't have to do something to prove to you physically in the natural realm that He loves you, but that you just take it by faith. Hebrews 11, 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And yet there's a lot of Christians that have a philosophy that, no, I don't want to just live by faith. I want to live by feeling. I want to have all of these things. Now, you could misunderstand what I'm saying and think that I'm saying that, you, you know, like a stoic, you aren't supposed to have any emotion. I have great emotions. Man, I, there's times that I tear up all of the time. I am a very emotional person, but 
I choose which emotions I, I want, and I, and I am not going to let them dictate to me and tell me things. Some of the greatest miracles I've ever seen were when I felt nothing. Now, there are times that I pray for people and I can literally feel virtue flow out of me. The Bible says that Jesus did that. And so I'm not against feelings. And there's times that I have tremendous feelings. Man, I've had supernatural highs with the Lord. I usually don't even talk about them because if I did, people would make a doctrine out of it and think, well, then I've got to be like Andrew. And unless I felt this, well, then God didn't do anything. That's not faith. I have feelings, and I've had wonderful feelings and emotions and, and experiences with the Lord, but I don't let that dominate me. If I spend an hour with the Lord and I don't get anything, if no angels show up, no uh, you know, angels singing, if there's no audible voice, if there's no goosebump, I still just believe that by faith that I am in the presence of the Lord and that I've enjoyed time with the Lord. You know, it's like a husband and wife, that there are special times of intimacy. There's times that, man, you just nearly are overwhelmed with emotions, but that's not the majority of the time. The vast majority of time, you are just going to have to learn how to relate to that person. One of the ways that I knew that Jamie uh, was the right one for me is because I didn't have to entertain her. Every time I went on a date prior to Jamie, I felt like I had to borrow my mother's car. I had to put on the... Uh, you know, the best face. I had to impress people. When I was with Jamie, we were just totally at ease with each other. It was like we just, it was like we were the same person nearly. I didn't have to do something to impress her. I remember I could take trips with her. I drove her down to East Texas to meet some of my relatives and we'd go 20, 30 minutes, not say a thing. And we just enjoyed being with each other. We didn't have to be doing something all of the time. And I tell you, that's one of the things that's held our marriage together. People who only have like the physical relationship or some kind of great emotional experience, and that's the only thing that holds your marriage together, that's the reason that your marriage won't last. It's because it's not built on mutual commitment and things like that. It's built on emotion. And I guarantee you, emotions are up and down like a yo-yo. And the same thing applies in our relationship with God. You can't have just every single time that you go in and pray just some overwhelming experience with the Lord. See, that's a philosophy that'll put you into trouble and it'll make you feel like, how come I'm not experiencing this? God isn't going to jump through a hoop. God's not going to be doing something special for you every single day. But many Christians have a wrong philosophy. Then there's other Christians that believe that all show of emotion is wrong. That would be similar to these Stoics here in Acts 17, 18, to where you aren't supposed to have any emotion. I remember being in a church one time. And man, I got blessed and I lifted my hands like this. Somebody came up and says, it's the first door on the left down the hall over here. The only time they lifted their hand in that church was if you needed to go to the bathroom or something like that. And I tell you, there's just some people that believe you aren't supposed to show any emotion that you're supposed to be stoic. Those are philosophies. And we could just continue on talking about pessimism, optimism. Those are philosophies. Whether you see yourself succeeding or whether you see yourself failing, those are philosophies. I've actually known people before that just had this drilled into them that you're a failure, that you can't do anything right. And even though they had talents and ability and mental capability, they wind up failing because that's the way they see themselves. Again, a verse I've used a lot, Proverbs 23, 7, as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. If you see yourself as a failure, you're going to fail. I don't care what talents you've got. I don't care what opportunities are given to you. You will wind up failing. I had a friend, he was an associate pastor with me for many, many years, Don Crow. And I knew Don, I knew his family, I knew his dad. His dad was a bitter, angry person. I don't know all the reasons why, but I experienced that. I saw it. He actually committed suicide and wrote a suicide note blaming his wife and children and said, it's all your fault. Even in death, he tried to make other people's lives bitter. And anyway, he told Don from the time that Don was a little kid, they worked on cars and did things in this farm. And he told Don, he said, you're so stupid, you can't even put a nut on a bolt without cross-threading it. 
and he just ragged on Don. Don was a grown man in his 30s and 40s when we were pastoring together in Childers, Texas, and we would work on cars and do things. And I would literally see Don shake when he would get to put a nut on a ball. And he would put the nut on and he would do it right, but he was afraid that he had done it wrong because of what had been spoken over him. And he would take it off and redo it and then think, well, I probably did that right. And he just kept doing it until every t single time he put a nut on a bolt. He cross-threaded it. That was a philosophy. That was a curse that was placed upon him. And the scripture says in Proverbs chapter 26, I believe it's verse 2 or 3, it says, the curse causeless shall not come. In other words, you don't have to accept curses. Man, if curses would kill you, I'd be dead. I've got so many people that hate me and have said lots of mean things about me, but the curse causeless, if, if you haven't opened up to it, if you haven't done anything to cause it, well, then you don't have to accept a curse. It doesn't matter what anybody else says about you. It's what you think about yourself. But if their words cause you to wind up cursing yourself and believing it and embracing those things, then it will affect you. All of these things that I'm talking about are the way you think. And people do not put enough emphasis on that. They think it's this family that I was born into that made me the way I am. They may have exerted control. They may have put pressure on you, but ultimately you have a choice whether you become bitter or better. It's not what is done to you. It's how you respond to what's done to you. It's how you think. Are you letting those things control you and change the way you think? Or are you letting God's Word dominate you? You have a choice. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19 said, Behold, I call heaven and earth to record against you this day that I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that you and your seed may live. God gave you the choice. Now, the world will try and force you and people will come against you. Circumstances will come against you, but you have the choice. He says, you choose life or death. This should be a no-brainer. Everybody ought to choose life over death. But just in case you have trouble, he says, choose life. Amen. He gives you the answer to this quiz. You have the choice. Nobody can make you a failure. Nobody can make you bitter. Nobody can destroy you and make you a victim without your consent and cooperation. It may not be intentional. It may not, you may not be aware that you've consented, but if Satan is destroying your life somewhere down the line, you have accepted those values, those things that were placed upon you. And I'm sharing the good news with you that you can change your philosophy, your way of looking at things. You can have a Christian philosophy. And if you receive that and renew your mind, then you will be transformed and you will prove the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. That's exactly what Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says. Those verses have changed my life, and the things that I'm saying here could change your life if you would receive it. And I know that many of you don't like this because it's taken away your excuses. You've been blaming everybody and everything else for your failures. I'm not saying that other people don't contribute to your failures and put, try and make you defeated, but you ultimately have the choice whether you win or lose. Welcome to our Thursday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing to teach through a series that I've entitled Christian Philosophy. And this book is a 280-page book that talks about what a Christian philosophy is, how it should affect our life, the first half is kind of theological. The second half is very practical about taking these truths and applying it to some of the major issues of today. And specifically, I focus on creation versus evolution, abortion, and homosexuality. And this book was written a long time ago, and yet I guarantee you it's gotten nothing but just more important. These issues have become even more front and center since I wrote it. And then this little booklet, Observing All Things, takes some of the pictures, the graphs that are in the second part of this book and just condenses them into kind of a reference thing. So we're offering this little booklet as a free gift. We're asking for a donation of any amount for that Christian philosophy book. And then I have a study guide. I have CDs, DVDs, and a USB that will also take this teaching. And I encourage you to please get this. 
It's really, really important. I promise you this is something that would bless you. So the first two days of this week, I basically was dealing from uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, where the scripture says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tra tradition of man, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. And I've taken a bunch of those words in that one verse and have been expounding on them. I like to use the word philosophy because that doesn't seem to resonate with most people, and so I get to define it. And that way, uh, steer their thinking on this. If you use worldview, if you use paradigm, those things are uh, sometimes misunderstood and misapplied. People have different things. But when you talk about philosophy, it just draws a blank. What this is talking about is the way you think. It's not individual thoughts. You have, to, you have to come up with an entire approach towards things. Whether you realize it or not, you have a philosophy about God. There are some people that see God as a harsh, mean, angry God. There's other people that see God as a distant, disconnected God and that He really doesn't have anything to do. There's some people that don't even believe there is a God. And if any one of those things that I've mentioned, see, if that's your overall view of things, it is going to dramatically impact the way that you live your life. People that don't believe there's a God, they don't believe they're accountable to anybody, it just frees them to live in sin. It frees them to take advantage of people, to rape, rape, punt, plunder, uh, do anything, because after all, there's no accountable accountability for anything. You know, another philosophy is an extreme sovereignty of God. There's a lot of Christians that believe that God is sovereign to the degree that He controls everything that you do, everything you say. Nothing happens but what God allows it. That's a wrong philosophy. And it'll lead to terrible things. For instance, in James chapter 4, verse 7, it says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So it says, Submit, yield to things that are from God, and then resist the devil. If you believe that God controls everything, then even if you resist the devil, you must be resisting God because God, the devil couldn't do anything without God's permission. That is just perverse on so many levels. And it leads people to being totally passive to where they don't resist the devil. They don't understand anything about authority that they have, and it leads to all kinds of problems. And yet that is a philosophy. It's a way, and people look at this and I even heard one guy, now this is extreme, most people don't take it this, to this extreme, but if, if the extreme sovereignty of God was true, well, then this would be an accurate statement. But I actually knew one guy who had a problem with lust. He was a pastor of church, and he was lusting after the women in his church. He said when he preached, he would in his mind just undress that woman and look at her, even while he was preaching. And he finally got so convicted about this that he realized that this must be demonic. And he actually had an appointment with somebody that was going to go and cast this spirit of lust out of him. And his words, I heard him say this, is that when he went out and put his hand on the door handle of his car, he said that the Lord stopped him and he says, you couldn't have these demons if I didn't allow it. Therefore, you, I gave this demonic lust to you to teach you something, and the guy canceled his appointment and, and took it that it must be God that gave him this spirit of lust. That's just perverse. I saw a thing on television where a man who I know, he's a friend of mine, he actually interviewed this woman who this woman and, his, and her daughter were abducted at gunpoint, taken out to a remote place. This man raped both of them, then had them lay on their stomach and shot them in the back of the head. And the daughter died. The mother survived. She had physical problems, but she survived. And she was on this television program saying that God allowed this and that this was God's will and that He somehow or another was working all of this together. That just 
that amazes me, but there are people that believe that God was the one who was into kidnapping, rape, and murder, and blame God for that. That's a philosophy. They look at the world through this and try and say that God does everything. You know, let me just put it to you this way. Does God control everything you do? I think if you were to be honest, there are some of you that know God wants you to go this way. He told you to do this, and you go that way. And if you'd be honest, every one of us have done that. So if God doesn't control you all of the time, and if you have a freedom of choice, well, then what makes you think He controls everybody else against their will? I tell you, that's a wrong philosophy. And this is how people are having Satan strip them, spoil them of the things that God has given them. It's through the way you think. Let me turn over here to Genesis chapter 3 and just show this to you. You know, if you go to the book of Genesis and you see how something first happened, it kind of sets a precedent all the way through the Bible. You can uh, take lessons from that. So right here is where Satan came against Adam and Eve and deceived them and drew them into temptation. And if you can understand how it happened to them, then you can understand that this is still how he's fighting against you. Matter of fact, over in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, it says, I fear lest as Satan beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be beguiled through the simplicity that's in Christ. In the same way that Satan came against Adam and Eve is the same way that he's coming against us. So how did he come against Adam and Eve? In Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now I'm going to go through a, a number of these scriptures here, and I won't finish all of this today. I've meditated on these verses literally thousands of hours. I could preach on just about every single word here for a long period of time. But I'm just going to hit some of the highlights. First of all, notice it says the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. And so Satan chose a subtle animal. You know, it says over in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 that as Satan beguiled Eve through his subtlety. So it shows you that Satan was the one behind this. And it also says over, Jesus is one that said this in John chapter 8 and verse 44. He says that Satan, the devil, is the father of all lies. And so these were lies that were spoken by the serpent. Satan is the father of all lies. As the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted through the simplicity that's in Christ. This was Satan that spoke through this animal. Man, there's a reason he had to use an animal. I'm not going to take time to do that, but it goes back to the authority of the believer. A spirit does not have authority. A snake has more authority than Satan had. He couldn't force Adam and Eve to do anything. If he could have forced them, he would have come and used something like a mammoth or an elephant or a tiger or some vicious animal to come and try and force them to yield to them. But he had no power to force them to do anything. Satan doesn't have any power to force you to do anything. There's some of you that have believed a lie. You've got a wrong philosophy and you think that Satan is stronger than you and that you just can't overcome this addiction, that you can't overcome this sin, that you can't do these things. That's a, lo that's a lie. It's a wrong philosophy. And you've, you've believed a lie someplace. Satan cannot do anything to you without your consent and cooperation. So that's the reason that Satan didn't enter into some big animal, you know, like a mammoth, and just put his foot on Eve's head and say, either eat of this tree or I'll smush your head like a melon. He didn't, he didn't tempt them. He didn't threaten them because he had no power against them. The Bible says that all angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who shall be heirs of salvation. Lucifer was created an angelic being, and he had no power against Adam and Eve. That's the reason he had to enter into the most subtle, the most deceptive. The word subtle means deceptive, cunning, sh sly. He entered into an animal that could, could use wisdom 
to somehow or another manipulate and lie to Eve. Boy, this is really important what I'm saying. Again, I've thought about these things for thousands of hours and there's just no way I can unpack everything that the Lord has shown me about this, but I pray that you get a revelation that Satan didn't come and force Adam and Eve into sin. He had no power to do it. He has no power to force you or me into defeat, into depression, into fear, into worry, into care, into sickness, into poverty. He can't do anything to us without our consent and cooperation. And I know that there's people right now that say, well, I haven't cooperated with the devil. Man, I've got cancer and I, there's no way. I didn't go ask for cancer. I didn't desire cancer. It just came upon me. Well, you didn't cooperate in the sense that you wanted it or sought it or something like that. And you may not have even cooperated in the sense that you weren't yielded to the devil and out living in sin to where you made yourself vulnerable to something that he wanted to do. But you did cooperate in the sense that when cancer came at you, you believed that you were only human and that cancer is incurable. And you believe that this is just the way that it has to be. The scripture says in Psalms chapter 91 that no plague will come nigh our dwelling, that he will give his angels charge over us and they'll bear us up in their hands so that we never even dash our foot against a stone, that, that only with our eyes will we see and behold the reward of the wicked. We've got promises that we can overcome anything that the devil throws at us. But if you don't believe those promises, if you're ignorant of it or if you've rejected it or if you've been taught that God is the one who puts sickness on you, that philosophy will stop you from re receiving the healing that God has for you. If you really believe that God is the one who made you sick, why would you go to the doctor and take medicine or have surgery trying to get out of God's will? See, that's just crazy. I tell you, only a religious person would believe this kind of stuff. That's a philosophy, and Satan can't just force you. So you may not have desired it. You may not have prayed for it. You may not have been cooperating through living in sin, but you've been thinking that, well, I'm only human, and sickness is just natural, and that, you know, as you get older, you have to have these things happen. Somehow or another, you have had Satan plant thoughts in your mind. You've accepted them, and that made you receptive to what Satan is trying to do in your life. If you were to understand that, man, I am above only and not beneath the head and not the tail, that this is the blessing of God and that, praise God, no plague is going to come nigh my dwelling. You know, I was just talking to somebody today who had a little bit of cold or something like that, and I said, man, you ought to come over here and hug me because no germ can touch my body and live. Man, you do that, you're going to get healed. I believe that. And I know that there's, I've had people tell me that I'm of the devil. I've got some pastors in my local town that on that very issue that I just said, branded me a cult and said that I'm of the devil. And yet that's exactly what Psalms 91 promises. But see, there's a lot of people that don't let the Bible get in the way of what they believe. And they just believe these things that are contrary to what God's word says. So you may not be saying, oh, devil, come destroy my life. But if you are accepting some of these wrong thoughts that you, you can't control whether you get sick or not, you can't control anything. You're just going with the flow and it just depends on what problems come into your life. If, if that's what you believe, if that's your philosophy, well, then you are cooperating with the devil. The Bible says in James 4, 7, submit yourselves therefore unto God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The word resist means to actively fight against. You got to be active. You can't be passive. To sit there and say, dear devil, please get off of my life. Or to say, God, would you please get the devil off of me? When he told you, you resist the devil. See, you are cooperating with the devil if you're just praying and asking God to do what he told you to do. You aren't believing what the word says. So these things here, this is really significant that he didn't go enter into some animal that could intimidate Eve, cause fear in her, force her to obey. He had no power to force her to do anything. And likewise, Satan has no power to force you or me 
into defeat in any area in our life. I know that there's many of you watching this that think this is just too good to be true. Well, that's what the gospel is. And I admit that it's rare that there's not a lot of Christians who will take the attitude that I'm talking about, but that doesn't mean it's wrong. This is what the scripture says. I'm telling you right here that Satan entered into the most cunning, sly, deceptive animal that God had created because he needed that deception. He had no power to force Adam and Eve into anything. And it's only through deception that Satan can come against you. Satan's only power is deception. Now, prior to Jesus coming, Satan was the God of this world and he was dominating people and they were in a bad state. But when Jesus came, Jesus dealt with the devil. Jesus said that he came out of hell with the keys of death and of hell dangling on his side. He literally renovated hell. He destroyed him that had the power of death. That is the devil out of Hebrews chapter 2. And Satan is a defeated foe. He doesn't have power to force you to do anything. His only power is deception. And that's the reason that it says over in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, Beware, be on guard, lest any man spoil you, strip from you through philosophy, through a way of thinking. And that's how he destroys you. Satan is coming against us with lies and deception. And sad to say, the church and religion has embraced and is the biggest propagator of many of Satan's lies. But the Word of God is the plumb line. The Word of God is absolute truth. If you want to be set free from any philosophy that is stripping you of what Jesus has purchased, you need to stick your nose in the Bible. You need to learn the Bible. And man, you need to let it be the dominant force in your life. Romans chapter 3 says, Yea, let God be true and every man a liar. You need to let God's Word be true and let the philosophy, the way of thinking, the paradigm, the worldview that this world has, you need to let it be a lie and let God's Word be absolute truth. Any success that I've ever seen in my life, and I've seen a lot of success. I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm not saying I've done everything I, the way I should, but I've done things... Uh, man, better than it would have been without the Word of God. Any success I've ever seen was because I have let God's Word dominate me and rule my life. And man, it has transformed me physically, emotionally, financially, in every single way. This is awesome. Again, I could just spend more and more time on that. I got a lot I want to say, but Satan had to Choose the most cunning, the most sly, deceptive animal because he had no power against them. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. Did you know the first thing Satan did to try and deceive Eve was to get her to doubt God's word? Boy, this is huge. You know, I mentioned earlier in the week that I now have a series that kind of is a an outgrowth of this teaching right here. And I've got a series entitled Biblical Worldview. And we've got four different volumes of that with over 15, 20 hours in each volume. And um, I believe that this is going to be something that will last long after the Lord has come back and taken me. And so I think that this is a legacy issue. But anyway, my point is that I've got a lot more teaching on all of this and in that first volume, I go into great depth about how do you know that the Word of God is actually God speaking through men versus men having their own thoughts and writing about God. And I go into all kinds of things. I haven't got time uh, to do that here, but man, this is exactly what Satan did right here. He came against the Word of God. Has God said? Because if Eve would have just stuck with what God said. God said over here in, in Genesis chapter 2 and in verse 16, it says, And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. 
IF EVE WOULD HAVE JUST STUCK WITH WHAT GOD SAID AND SAID, LOOK, GOD TOLD US NOT TO EAT OF THIS TREE, AND SO I'M NOT GOING TO QUESTION WHAT HIS MOTIVE IS, WHY HE SAID IT. HE'S GOD. I'M NOT. AND I'M JUST GOING TO GO BY WHAT GOD SAID. IF SHE'D HAVE JUST ENDED THE CONVERSATION RIGHT THERE AND SAID, LOOK, I'M NOT GOING TO ENTERTAIN ANY THOUGHTS. IT DOESN'T MATTER TO ME WHY GOD SAID WHAT HE SAID. IF SHE'D HAVE DONE THAT, SHE WOULDN'T HAVE SINNED. BUT SATAN CAME, AND THE VERY FIRST THING HE HAD TO DO TO GET ADAM AND EVE INTO SIN WAS TO GET THEM TO QUESTION WHAT GOD HAD SAID. AND I'M SAYING THIS IN LOVE TO YOU, BUT WE LIVE IN A FALLEN WORLD. WE LIVE IN A CORRUPT WORLD. YOU KNOW, I LIVE IN THE UNITED STATES. THIS PROGRAM IS SEEN ALL AROUND THE WORLD, BUT THE UNITED STATES IS ONE OF THE BEST PLACES ON THE PLANET AND YET THE OVERALL PHILOSOPHY, THE OVERALL THINKING OF AMERICANS IS UNGODLY. WE ARE ADOPTING VALUES THAT GO AGAINST THE WORD OF GOD. IT'S GOTTEN TO WHERE THE WORD OF GOD IS NOT POPULAR. THE ONLY PEOPLE THAT IT'S RIGHT TO PERSECUTE, POLITICALLY CORRECT TO PERSECUTE IN THE UNITED STATES TODAY IS CHRISTIANS, MORAL PEOPLE. THE UNGODLY, YOU CAN'T CRITICIZE THEM. YOU CAN'T SPEAK AGAINST ANYTHING THEY DO OR THEY'LL CALL YOU A HOMOPHOBE OR A BIGOT OR SOMETHING LIKE THAT. BUT CHRISTIANS, you can, dis- YOU CAN PERSECUTE THEM. YOU CAN DISCRIMINATE AGAINST THEM. It's, IT'S UNGODLY. AND IT'S BECAUSE THEY HAVE FORSAKEN THE WORD OF GOD. WELCOME TO OUR FRIDAY'S BROADCAST OF THE GOSPEL TRUTH. TODAY'S THE END OF MY FIRST WEEK TEACHING ON CHRISTIAN PHILOSOPHY. I'VE GOT A 280-PAGE BOOK ON THIS, AND THIS IS KIND OF A UNIQUE BOOK FROM ALL OF THE OTHERS THAT I'VE WRITTEN. THE FIRST HALF OF THIS IS THEOLOGICAL. IT'S ABOUT ALL OF THE THINGS THAT I'VE BEEN TALKING ABOUT THIS WEEK. THE SECOND HALF OF THIS IS HOW DO YOU APPLY THIS TO OUR CULTURE? AND I DEAL SPECIFICALLY WITH CREATION VERSUS EVOLUTION, ABORTION AND HOMOSEXUALITY. I HAVE PICTURES IN HERE, uh, SOME THINGS TO VERIFY CREATION VERSUS EVOLUTION. I'VE GOT uh, DETAILS IN HERE ABOUT ABORTION. I'VE GOT GRAPHS AND uh, CHARTS THAT WERE TAKEN FROM HOMOSEXUAL WEBSITES BACK 20 YEARS AGO. THEY'VE SINCE SCRUBBED THEM BECAUSE THEY DIDN'T WANT THIS INFORMATION TO BE OUT, BUT I'VE GOT THESE THINGS IN HERE. AND THEN THIS LITTLE BOOKLET IS JUST the SOME OF THE PICTURES THE CHARTS AND THE GRAPHS THAT ARE IN THE SECOND HALF OF THIS BOOK. AND THIS IS JUST A LITTLE BRIEF SUMMARY OF THIS THAT YOU CAN USE KIND OF FOR REFERENCE. WE'RE OFFERING THIS AS A FREE GIFT TO ANYONE. THIS IS A 280-PAGE BOOK, AND WE ARE ASKING FOR A DONATION OF SOME AMOUNT FOR THAT BOOK. WE'LL PUT OUT TENS OF THOUSANDS OF THOSE, AND WE DO ASK YOU TO GIVE SOMETHING TO HELP IT. I'VE ALREADY COVERED A LOT OF MATERIAL ABOUT WHAT A CHRISTIAN PHILOSOPHY IS. IT'S TALKING ABOUT A WAY OF THINKING, A PARADIGM, A WORLD VIEW, A LENS THROUGH WHICH YOU JUDGE AND EVALUATE EVERYTHING. AND I'VE GIVEN MANY, MANY EXAMPLES. ON YESTERDAY'S PROGRAM, I WAS uh, USING ADAM AND EVE AS AN EXAMPLE OF THIS. AND IN GENESIS CHAPTER 3, VERSE 1, IT SAYS, NOW THE SERPENT WAS MORE SUBTLE THAN ANY BEAST OF THE FIELD WHICH THE LORD GOD HAD MADE. AND I WAS MAKING THE POINT YESTERDAY THAT SATAN DIDN'T CHOOSE THE BIGGEST ANIMAL, THE STRONGEST ANIMAL, THE MOST VICIOUS ANIMAL TO TRY AND INTIMIDATE OR FORCE ADAM AND EVE INTO DOING SOMETHING. INSTEAD, HE CHOSE THE MOST SUBTLE, THE MOST SLY, CUNNING, DECEPTIVE ANIMAL OUT OF ALL OF THE BEASTS which THE LORD HAD CREATED. AND THEN HE SAID UNTO THE WOMAN, YEA, HATH GOD SAID. SO THE NEXT THING HE DID, HE ATTACKED GOD'S WORD. AND THIS IS WHAT I ENDED WITH ON YESTERDAY'S PROGRAM, THAT SATAN CAN'T DO ANYTHING TO YOU WITHOUT YOUR CONSENT AND COOPERATION. HE HAS TO SOMEHOW OR ANOTHER DECEIVE YOU INTO THINKING WRONG. WHAT KEEPS YOUR THINKING FROM BEING WRONG? WELL, THAT VERSE THAT I STARTED WITH, COLOSSIANS 2, 8, BEWARE LEST ANY MAN SPOIL YOU THROUGH PHILOSOPHY. THAT'S TALKING ABOUT THE WAY YOU THINK. SATAN COMES AGAINST YOU THROUGH THE WAY YOU THINK. AND THE AND THE GREATEST THING THAT GOD EVER GAVE US OUTSIDE OF JESUS COMING AND DYING FOR US AND THEN LEAVING THE HOLY SPIRIT, THE NEXT GREATEST THING THAT GOD HAS EVER GIVEN US IS THE WORD OF GOD. MAN, THE WORD OF GOD IS TRUTH. JOHN CHAPTER 17, VERSE 17, JESUS SAID, SANCTIFY THEM THROUGH THY TRUTH. THY WORD IS TRUTH. THIS IS TRUTH. THIS IS ABSOLUTE TRUTH. 
AND IT DOESN'T CHANGE WITH CIRCUMSTANCES. IT DOESN'T CHANGE WITH CULTURES AND THINGS LIKE THIS. I REMEMBER BILL CLINTON, WHO WAS THE PRESIDENT OF THE UNITED STATES, FOR THOSE OF YOU WHO ARE OUTSIDE OF THE U.S. MAY NOT KNOW THAT, BUT BILL CLINTON CLAIMED TO BE A BORN-AGAIN CHRISTIAN, AND YET HE ADVOCATED HOMOSEXUALITY. HE LIVED AN UNGODLY LIFESTYLE, HAD SEXUAL ESCAPADES AND DIFFERENT THINGS LIKE THIS. AND ONE OF THE REPORTERS ONE TIME ASKED HIM, HOW CAN YOU CLAIM TO BE A BORN-AGAIN CHRISTIAN AND YET EMBRACE SOME OF THE VALUES THAT YOU HAVE? AND YOU KNOW, HIS ANSWER BASICALLY WAS THAT THE BIBLE WAS WRITTEN TO THAT CULTURE BACK THEN. IT WAS RELATIVE TO THEM. WE LIVE IN A DIFFERENT DAY AND AGE, AND THE BIBLE DOESN'T APPLY TO US IN THE SAME WAY. WE CAN'T LIVE BY THE SAME STANDARDS. THAT'S AN ABSOLUTE LIE. THAT'S A DECEPTION. THE WORD OF GOD, MAN, IT'LL LAST LONG AFTER THIS UNGODLY CULTURE IS GONE. THE WORD OF GOD HAS BEEN FOUGHT AGAINST. YOU KNOW, VOLTAIRE, WHO IS ONE OF THE leading, LEADING ATHEIST IN FRANCE, HE ACTUALLY PREDICTED THAT WITHIN A HUNDRED YEARS, THE BIBLE WOULDN'T EXIST, THAT IT WOULD BE step, STOMPED OUT. YOU KNOW, THEY WENT THROUGH THE FRENCH REVOLUTION THAT WAS A GODLESS REVOLUTION, AND THEY STARTED KILLING CHRISTIANS BY THE HUNDREDS OF THOUSANDS, AND TERRIBLE THINGS HAPPENED. AND ANYWAY, HE PREDICTED THAT THE BIBLE WOULD BE TOTALLY ERADICATED. DID YOU KNOW ON THE 100th ANNIVERSARY OF VOLTAIRE'S BIRTHDAY, THEY ACTUALLY PRINTED GUTENBERG BIBLES IN HIS HOUSE. THEY TURNED IT INTO A PRINT SHOP AND PRINTED BIBLES. <laughs> AND HE SAID IT WOULD BE ERADICATED, AND IT WASN'T. THAT WAS BACK IN THE 1790s IS WHEN I THINK HE MADE THAT STATEMENT AND STUFF. AND I GUARANTEE YOU, THE BIBLE HAS OUTLASTED ALL OF ITS CRITICS. THE WORD OF GOD IS GOD SPEAKING THROUGH MAN. IT'S NOT GOD TALKING ABOUT MAN. IT SAYS THAT the, IT WAS INSPIRED OF GOD OVER IN uh, 2 TIMOTHY chapter 3, VERSE 16 AND 17. IT SAYS, ALL SCRIPTURE IS GIVEN BY INSPIRATION OF GOD AND IS PROFITABLE FOR DOCTRINE, FOR REPROOF, FOR CORRECTION, FOR INSTRUCTION IN RIGHTEOUSNESS THAT THE MAN OF GOD MIGHT BE PERFECT, THOROUGHLY FURNISHED UNTO ALL GOOD WORKS. AND THOSE WORDS, IF YOU LOOK THEM UP, WHEN IT SAYS ALL SCRIPTURE IS GIVEN BY INSPIRATION OF GOD, IN THE GREEK, THAT LITERALLY MEANS IT'S GOD-BREATHED. AND THEN YOU COMPARE THAT WITH 2 PETER CHAPTER 1, AND IT SAYS OVER THERE THAT WE HAVE ALSO A MORE SURE WORD OF PROPHECY, whereunto YOU DO WELL, THAT YOU MIGHT TAKE HEED AS UNTO A LIGHT THAT SHINETH IN A DARK PLACE UNTIL THE DAY DAWN AND THE DAY STAR ARISE IN YOUR HEART, KNOWING THIS THAT NO PROPHECY OF THE SCRIPTURE IS OF ANY PRIVATE INTERPRETATION, FOR THE PROPHECY CAME NOT IN OLD TIME BY THE WILL OF MAN, BUT HOLY MEN OF GOD SPAKE AS THEY WERE MOVED BY THE HOLY GHOST. DID YOU KNOW IN W. E. VINE'S uh, EXPOSITORY DICTIONARY OF THE ENGLISH LANGUAGE, and, AND HE WENT INTO THE GREEK AND HEBREW, that HE SAID RIGHT HERE THAT THIS MEANS THAT THEY WERE CARRIED ALONG BY THE HOLY SPIRIT that it was inspired and directed by the Holy Spirit. So anyway, I say all of these things to say that we've got to get to a place to where God's Word is not a vague representation of who God is and how He wants us to live, but this is God-breathed. It's inspired by God. This is God supernaturally moving through men. AND I'M NOT GOING TO TAKE TIME TO GO INTO IT HERE, BUT I'VE MENTIONED THIS BEFORE, THAT I NOW HAVE A SERIES THAT'S ENTITLED BIBLICAL WORLDVIEW, AND WE'VE GOT FOUR DIFFERENT VOLUMES ON THIS, AND THE VERY FIRST ONE IS ENTITLED FOUNDATION TRUTHS, AND IN THERE I SPEND 90 MINUTES TALKING ABOUT THE INFALLIBILITY OF SCRIPTURE, AND I GO INTO COMPARING THE NUMBER OF MANUSCRIPTS THAT WE HAVE OF THE BIBLE COMPARED TO SOME OF THE GREAT WORKS THAT ARE CONSIDERED BY PEOPLE TO BE ACCURATE, AND YET THE WORD OF GOD IS INFINITELY MORE ACCURATE. AND THERE WAS TRANSLATIONS THAT CAME ALONG, AND uh, LIKE, FOR INSTANCE, THE DEAD SEA SCROLLS WERE FOUND IN THE uh, 1950s, AND THEY HAD COPIES OF SCRIPTURE THAT WERE WRITTEN A THOUSAND YEARS BEFORE, AND THE VARIATIONS BETWEEN THESE COPIES THAT WERE MADE AROUND THE TIME OF CHRIST COMPARED TO THE uh, COPIES THAT WERE MADE, YOU KNOW, HUNDREDS OF YEARS LATER, LIKE WHEN THE KING JAMES BIBLE WAS TRANSLATED IN THE 1600s. 
The, the differences are minuscule, like the dotting of an I, a crossing of the T. And there is no other document in human history that has been copied so many times and has been preserved so strictly. And on and on you could go. You could go take prophecy. And again, in this biblical worldview thing, I go into this in a lot more detail and give actual quotes and we have charts and graphs that prove these things. But you could go into so many things. Prophecy is one of the greatest indications that the Word of God is inspired by God, not by men. There is no other book in the history of the world that even comes close to the number of prophecies and the number of fulfilled prophecies. Like just concerning Jesus, there was over 300 Old Testament prophecies concerning Jesus, and they were fulfilled down to the last little detail, even to the point that they offered him gall to uh, drink, and he refused it, that they parted his garments, and they tore the cheaper garments into pieces and parted them among the soldiers. But the vesture, that uh, the cloak that was one uh, one piece and it was woven throughout so that it didn't have a seam. It was worth enough that instead of tearing it into pieces, they cast lot for it. That was prophesied in the Old Testament. It was prophesied that Jesus would make his, his uh, burial with the rich and with the wicked. Those two things don't seem to usually go together and yet it was fulfilled because he was crucified between two thieves and yet he was buried in a rich man's tomb. There was over 300 prophecies specific to Jesus that were fulfilled to the last detail. There is no other record of anything like that. You know, there's some prophecies about Rasmussen that some people think were prophetic and talking about today, and yet there's only like a handful of them, four or five, and it's really doubtful whether those prophecies have actually been fulfilled or not. It takes some interpretation. But that's only like a handful. This is over 300 prophecies. If you took the law of uh, probability, which I, when I was in school, in, in college, I was a math major and I actually studied the law of probability. And if you look at things, anything to the 10th power it, or maybe the 12th power is st statistically impossible. And yet the chances of just 100 of those prophecies of Jesus coming to pass is like one with, a, uh, you know, a thousand or 10,000 zeros behind it. It's statistically impossible. Prophecy is one of the greatest things. This book has been fulfilled. It has stood the test of time. And on and on and on and on and on I could go. In a sense, you could give a pass to Eve because she didn't know. There had never been sin. There had never been war. There had never been deception and lies. And she just didn't realize. She wasn't, you know, like it says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, beware lest you be spoiled through philosophy. Eve had never seen anything, uh, anybody come against the Word of God. And so in a sense, you could nearly give her a pass and say she wasn't aware of what was going on. But she began to doubt God's Word. And I can guarantee you, in our fallen world, this is one of Satan's main attacks. If he couldn't get you to doubt God's Word, if he couldn't doubt, get you to doubt that marriage is between a man and a woman, if he couldn't get you to doubt that you were born a male or a female and that you can't just choose how you feel that day as to what your gender is, that it's determined biologically, if he couldn't get you to doubt all of these things that are revealed in God's Word, He couldn't lead you into sin. But see, Satan is attacking the Word of God. This is why he's coming against all of the standards of morality that are given in the Word of God. This is like an owner's manual. You know, if you have a vehicle, I got a new vehicle just a year or so ago, and I didn't know how to work some of the things. I had to go to the owner manual and find out how do you do these things? How do you make these things work? It's so computerized. I had to sit there and read the owner's manual and follow the directions. Likewise, you can't just figure out life on your own. God gave us the Word. This is the owner's manual that tells us how we're supposed to act. If something goes wrong, how to fix it. And yet Satan, see, came against the Word of God. That's the first thing he did with Eve. And this is the first thing he does with us. 
There are people watching this program right now that you do not believe that the Word of God is accurate in every detail. You do not believe that it is for us. You agree with Bill Clinton that it's, you know, relative to the culture that you live in. You can take it or leave it. You know, in a sense, what that is, that's you making yourself God. You're saying, I don't care what God says in His Word. Here's what I believe. So I, you are exalting your opinion above God's opinion. You're making yourself God. That's idolatry. You think that you, it's up to you to pick and choose whatever you want. I'll agree with this, that God gave you freedom of choice. You can choose whatever you want, but that doesn't mean that your choices are right. They're, the right choice is to go by what He said. The right choice is to submit yourself to God and to the truths that He put forth in His Word. You do have freedom of choice. I'm not going to sit there and ever try and force anybody to be saved, but I am going to take the truth, and I'm going to share the truth with you, knowing that the truth will make you free, John chapter 8, verse 32. But it's only the truth that you believe and accept that will set you free. If you reject the truth, which God's Word is truth, then you are rejecting your only hope of salvation. Someday we are going to be judged by the things written in this book. God is going to hold us accountable. And you might say, well, I don't believe that. It doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. You know, the Bible says that the Word is sharper than any two-edged sword, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Also in Ephesians chapter 6, it says to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Word of God is like a sword. And if I had a sword in my hand and you say, I don't believe that, it does, you don't have to believe it for me to kill you with it, for me to stab you with it, cut you with it, doesn't matter if you believe it or not, it's still going to work. And you may sit there and say, well, I don't believe the Word of God. That's not going to change the fact that that is the truth and that this is God that revealed it to you. And you're going to be held accountable someday for every single thing written in the Word of God. Some of you think, well, I hadn't even read it. Well, that's your problem. But it's still truth. And God is going to hold you accountable for these things in the Word of God. If Adam and Eve had taken what God said, don't eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. If you look this up in the Hebrew over here in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, where it says, you shall surely die, it literally says you will die, die. It repeats the same word. And it's just for the purpose of emphasis to say that this is something that is sure. It is unchangeable. So it's not wrong to translate it as you will surely die, but it literally means you will die, die. He repeated it to say it is unchangeable. It, it will not change. And yet Satan came up and began to say, are you sure that God meant exactly what he said? Are you sure that you will die or maybe you will just die? Anytime you begin to start casting doubt on what God's word says, this is the devil that is inspiring this. Just like he did through the serpent in the Garden of Eden, it's Satan that has got people to doubt the Word of God. I tell you, I believe this book from Genesis to Maps. I believe every bit of it. I believe that it's unchangeable. I believe that it's given by inspiration of God, and I've based my life on it. And you may disagree and think, well, I don't agree with you and you're wrong. I'm not saying this in a prideful, bragging way. I'm saying it in a way to try and verify what I'm saying. But I have seen things happen in my life that most of you haven't seen. I saw my son raised from the dead after he was dead over four hours, between four and five hours. He was in a morgue, stripped naked, with a toe tag on, on a cooler, and they called me, and I prayed, and he sat up and started talking, and he was just over at my house yesterday. That was back in 2001. It's now been over 20 years. He's alive and well, and in the next uh, year, he had a little girl, our only granddaughter. I've seen my son raised from the dead with no brain damage after being dead for over four hours. I've seen my wife raised from the dead. I've seen blind eyes open, deaf ears open. I've seen God provide my needs, which is promised in this word. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, But my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. I have seen hundreds of millions of dollars 
COME IN, AND I USED TO BE SO POOR I COULDN'T PAY ATTENTION. I'VE SEEN THE WORD OF GOD PRODUCE FINANCIAL PROSPERITY IN MY LIFE. I'VE SEEN THE WORD OF GOD RECONCILE ME WITH PEOPLE BECAUSE I TURNED THE OTHER CHEEK AND I OPERATED IN FORGIVENESS INSTEAD OF GIVING THEM WHAT THEY'VE GIVEN ME. I'VE SEEN THE WORD OF GOD JUST CHANGE MY WHOLE ATTITUDE ON EVERYTHING. AND THERE ARE MANY OF YOU THAT ARE THINKING THAT I'M FOOLISH AND THAT YOU ARE SO MUCH SUPERIOR, AND YET HOW HAS YOUR BELIEF SYSTEM, HOW HAS YOUR PHILOSOPHY WORKED FOR YOU? I'M TELLING YOU, IF YOU JUST LOOK AT RESULTS, MAN, I'D CHOOSE THE WAY IT'S WORKING FOR ME OVER THE WAY IT'S WORKING FOR YOU ANY DAY. AGAIN, I'M NOT SAYING THAT TO PUT YOU DOWN, AND I'M NOT SAYING IT TO EXALT ME. I'M SAYING IT TO EXALT THE TRUTH. I'M SAYING I HAVE PROVEN THE WORD OF GOD. I HAVE PROVEN THAT IT WORKS IN MY LIFE. THERE ARE SOME OF YOU THAT MAY HAVE AN ARGUMENT, AND YOU MAY HAVE A COMPLAINT, BUT YOU DON'T HAVE THE TRUTH. YOU NEED TO RESPOND TODAY. YOU NEED TO BOW YOUR KNEE. THERE ARE SOME OF YOU THINKING, WELL, I DON'T AGREE WITH ANYTHING YOU'RE SAYING. YOU HADN'T EVEN READ THE WORD OF GOD. I PROMISE YOU, IF YOU WERE TO READ IT, EVEN IF YOU READ IT WITH THE WRONG ATTITUDE, BUT IF YOU READ THE BIBLE FROM GENESIS TO REVELATION, GOD WOULD BEGIN TO TOUCH YOU. GOD WOULD SPEAK TO YOU THROUGH THIS WORD. AND YOU WOULD HAVE TO LITERALLY JUST REFUSE TO RESPOND. BUT I CAN GUARANTEE YOU, THIS IS NOT LIKE ANY OTHER BOOK. THIS BOOK IS INSPIRED. THIS IS GOD-BREATHED. AND IF YOU WOULD GET IN IT AND START READING IT AND STUDYING IT, I GUARANTEE YOU, GOD WOULD TRANSFORM YOUR LIFE. IN A SENSE, EVE DIDN'T HAVE THIS PERSPECTIVE. SHE DIDN'T KNOW WHAT WAS AT STAKE. BUT I CAN GUARANTEE YOU, AFTER THEY SUBMITTED TO THE LIES OF THE DEVIL, AFTER THEY QUESTIONED GOD'S WORD, AND THEY DID IT THEIR WAY, THEM AND FRANK SINATRA DID IT THEIR WAY, I CAN GUARANTEE YOU, EVE REGRETTED THE DAY THAT SHE DOUBTED GOD'S WORD. IT UNLEASHED THE DEVIL AND ALL OF HIS HORDES OF DEMONS ON THIS PLANET THROUGH HER DISOBEDIENCE. AND IT ALL STARTED WITH SATAN SAYING, HAS GOD SAID SHE SHOULD HAVE SAID YES. THAT'S WHAT HE SAID. END OF DECISION, END OF DISCUSSION. MY DECISION IS PERMANENT. GOD'S WORD IS TRUE. AND IF SHE'D HAVE DONE THAT, PRAISE GOD, SHE'D HAVE STILL BEEN IN THE GARDEN OF EDEN. Well, THIS IS POWERFUL, WHAT I'M SAYING. AND I KNOW THAT THERE'S NOT VERY MANY PEOPLE THAT HAVE THE ATTITUDE THAT I'M TALKING ABOUT, THE ATTITUDE THAT THE WORD OF GOD TEACHES, AND THAT'S THE REASON THAT NOT VERY MANY PEOPLE WALK IN HEALING, PROSPERITY, DELIVERANCE, JOY, PEACE, FREEDOM, AND ALL THESE KIND OF THINGS. YOU KNOW, I HAD SOME THINGS HAPPEN YESTERDAY THAT I HAD SOMEONE CALL ME BECAUSE IT WAS REALLY TRAGIC AND IT COULD BE POTENTIALLY DAMAGING TO US, AND THEY JUST FELT OBLIGATED TO COME TELL ME. AND SO I SAID, WELL, THANKS FOR CALLING ME AND LET ME KNOW. BUT I SAID, YOU KNOW, I DON'T CARE. I SAID, GOD, GOD'S THE ONE WHO HAS BLESSED ME AND HAS OPENED UP THESE DOORS, AND IF A DOOR SHUTS ON ME, GOD WILL OPEN UP ANOTHER DOOR. AND I GOT THAT FROM THE WORD OF GOD. I'VE SEEN IT IN THE LIVES OF HUNDREDS OF PEOPLE RECORDED IN SCRIPTURE. AND BECAUSE OF IT, I JUST REACT DIFFERENTLY TO PROBLEMS THAN I WOULD HAVE. I KNOW I WOULD HAVE OPERATED DIFFERENTLY IF I HADN'T have BEEN IN THE WORD OF GOD. AND I OPERATE DIFFERENTLY THAN MOST PEOPLE DO BECAUSE THE WORD OF GOD HAS CHANGED MY ATTITUDE AND MY OUTLOOK ON THINGS. GOD IS MY SOURCE, NOT PEOPLE, NOT OTHER THINGS. MAN, THAT'S IMPORTANT WHAT I'M SAYING. THERE ARE MANY OF YOU THAT NEED WHAT I'M SAYING. YOU NEED WHAT I'M EXPERIENCING, AND I'M TELLING YOU, IT COMES THROUGH THE WORD OF GOD. THAT IS A PHILOSOPHY. YOU NEED TO BELIEVE EVERY JOT AND EVERY TITTLE OF THE WORD OF GOD AND MAKE IT THE FOUNDATION OF YOUR LIFE. IF YOU WOULD DO THAT, IT WOULD LITERALLY TRANSFORM YOU. WELCOME TO OUR MONDAY'S BROADCAST OF THE GOSPEL TRUTH. TODAY IS THE BEGINNING OF MY SECOND WEEK TEACHING ON CHRISTIAN PHILOSOPHY. I WROTE A BOOK ABOUT THIS MANY YEARS AGO, AND THE FIRST HALF OF THIS BOOK IS THE EXACT THINGS THAT I'VE BEEN TEACHING LAST WEEK AND THEN AGAIN TODAY. THE SECOND HALF OF THIS BOOK IS ABOUT APPLYING A CHRISTIAN PHILOSOPHY, A CHRISTIAN WORLDVIEW, A CHRISTIAN WAY OF LOOKING AT THINGS TO SOCIAL ISSUES SUCH AS ABORTION AND HOMOSEXUALITY AND EVOLUTION. AND SO I'VE GOT A LOT OF PICTURES, COLOR PICTURES IN HERE, GRAPHS AND THINGS. AND THEN THIS LITTLE BOOKLET IS TAKING THE PICTURES AND THE GRAPHS AND SOME OF THE INFORMATION THAT'S AT THE END OF THIS BOOK 
and it's just put in it in a convenient form so that you can have quick reference. So this is a free gift to you. This is for a donation of any amount. We also have CDs, DVDs, a USB, and a study guide, and our announcer will give you all that information at the end of the program today. Let me just go back to Genesis chapter 3, and if you missed any of this, uh, the word philosophy doesn't mean a lot to most people, but it's talking about the way you think, not individual thoughts, but an entire worldview, a paradigm, a way of looking at things. And I'm using Genesis chapter 3 because this is where Satan came against Eve and tempted her. And I've already pointed out in this first verse that he didn't choose a big animal to overpower her, some animal to intimidate her. He didn't use fear, coercion. He didn't have any power against her, and Satan doesn't have any power against us. He had to use the most subtle, the most sly, cunning, deceptive animal to come and to tempt them. And the very first thing he spoke to them through this snake was, Has God said? And I was dealing with this last Friday that before Satan can get us into any type of sin, failure, problem in our life, somehow he has to get us to disbelieve the truth. Jesus said in John chapter 17, verse 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. God's word is truth. And I spent a lot of time last Friday talking about how that the Bible doesn't just contain the word of God, the Bible is the Word of God. It is inspired. God breathed. People wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. This isn't men talking about God, but this is God talking through man and revealing Himself unto us. Man, that is so important that people understand that. And you know, we have the potential of 5.2 billion people watching this program worldwide. I'm certainly aware that a very small percentage of those actually watch. But we have millions and millions of people that watch this program on a daily basis. And yet I'm pretty confident to say that out of the millions of people who watch it, there is a very small percentage of those people who actually believe in the Word of God without reservation. Again, they may, be, and may call this the Word of God and say they believe the Word of God, but they don't base their life on it. They don't let the Word of God control their thoughts. They don't let the Word of God get in the way of the decisions that they make every day. Man, that's a recipe for disaster. If Eve would have just stuck with what God said in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, don't eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because in the day you eat thereof, you will surely die. If she would have just stuck with that and said, I refuse to consider anything contrary to what God says, they wouldn't have entered into sin. That's amazing. That is absolutely amazing. It's really this simple. If you were to just take the Word of God and believe it and base your life upon it, I guarantee you it would set you free. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 32, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Then in John 17, 17, Thy word is truth. The truth will set you free, but it's only the truth you know that sets you free, and it's only the truth that you know enough and believe it enough to act on it and base your life on it that will set you free. What you don't know in the Word of God is how Satan is destroying your life. That's a big statement, but I believe that with all of my heart. I can testify my own personal life that, man, I was raised in a church that believed that all of the miracles passed away with the apostles. They believed that God could do anything, but it certainly wasn't a normal occurrence. They, they would pray, and if they'd have gotten a miracle, it would have surprised them as much as anybody else. So anyway, they didn't teach the full counsel of the Word of God. It wasn't a full gospel. The only thing they preached completely was getting born again. And then once you were born again, you just sang a song about when we all get to heaven, what a day that's going to be. But in the rough now and now, there was just no victory whatsoever. You just were hold on. You were saving, saved and stuck. Hold on because God is coming. That's actually a song that we sang. Hold the fort for I am coming. <laughs> and it was just, it was, it was not the way it should have been. And yet when I got hold of the truth of the Word of God, 
I CHANGED. IT CHANGED ME. THE WORD OF GOD CHANGED ME, AND I HAVE BEEN SEEING SUPERNATURAL, MIRACULOUS HEALING AND PROSPERITY AND JOY AND PEACE. I HAVE HAD PEACE WHEN IN THE NATURAL THERE IS NO REASON THAT I SHOULD HAVE PEACE, AND IT ALL COMES BECAUSE OF THE WORD OF GOD. JUST LIKE IT SAYS IN ISAIAH CHAPTER 26, VERSE 3, THE LORD WILL KEEP HIM IN PERFECT PEACE WHOSE MIND IS STAYED UPON HIM BECAUSE HE TRUSTED IN HIM. IF YOU DON'T HAVE PERFECT PEACE, IT'S BECAUSE YOU AREN'T KEEPING YOUR MIND STAYED UPON HIM THROUGH STUDYING THE WORD OF GOD. END OF DISCUSSION. NO ALTERNATIVES. IT'S NOT BECAUSE YOU HAVE A CHEMICAL IMBALANCE. IT'S NOT BECAUSE OF ANY OF THESE OTHER THINGS THAT WE USE AS AN EXCUSE. IF YOU KEEP YOUR MIND STAYED UPON THE LORD THROUGH THE WORD OF GOD, YOU WILL HAVE PERFECT PEACE. ROMANS CHAPTER 5, VERSE 1, THEREFORE BEING JUSTIFIED BY FAITH, WE HAVE PEACE WITH GOD THROUGH OUR LORD JESUS CHRIST. IF YOU DON'T HAVE PEACE, IT'S BECAUSE YOU AREN'T ABIDING IN THE WORD OF GOD. JESUS SAID IN JOHN CHAPTER 15, IF YOU ABIDE IN ME AND MY WORDS ABIDE IN YOU, THEN YOU SHALL ASK WHAT YOU WILL AND IT SHALL BE DONE UNTO YOU. IT'S NOT A MATTER OF JUST GETTING BORN AGAIN AND BEING IN CHRIST, BUT YOU'VE GOT TO HAVE HIS WORD ABIDING IN YOU. ROMANS CHAPTER 10, VERSE 17 SAYS, SO THEN FAITH COMES BY HEARING AND HEARING BY THE WORD OF GOD. SO I'VE BEEN TALKING ABOUT A CHRISTIAN PHILOSOPHY, A CHRISTIAN WAY OF THINKING, AND I'M TELLING YOU, ONE OF THE MOST IMPORTANT PHILOSOPHIES THAT YOU COULD EVER GET IS THAT GOD'S WORD IS ABSOLUTE, UNQUALIFIED, un INFALLIBLE TRUTH, AND YOU NEED TO BASE YOUR LIFE ON THE WORD OF GOD. AND I SAID THIS ON LAST WEEK'S PROGRAM, BUT THERE ARE MANY OF YOU THAT JUST THINK I'M CRAZY FOR DOING THIS. I WOULD NEVER BELIEVE EVERYTHING WRITTEN IN THIS BOOK THOUSANDS OF YEARS AGO. WHAT DOES IT HAVE TO DO WITH ANYTHING TODAY? MAN, I WOULD STACK MY LIFE, AND I'M NOT DOING THIS BECAUSE OF MY GOODNESS OR BECAUSE OF ANY VIRTUE ON MY OWN, BUT I'M SAYING I HAVE RECEIVED THE TRUTH OF THE WORD OF GOD. AND IT SAYS OVER IN 1 PETER CHAPTER 1, VERSE 23, BEING BORN AGAIN, NOT OF CORRUPTIBLE SEED, BUT OF INCORRUPTIBLE BY THE WORD OF GOD THAT LIVES AND ABIDES FOREVER. CALLS THE WORD AN INCORRUPTIBLE SEED. I HAVE RECEIVED THIS SEED INTO MY LIFE, AND IT'S BEARING FRUIT. AND I WOULD COMPARE THE FRUIT THAT'S IN MY LIFE WITH THE TURMOIL AND THE CONFUSION AND THE LACK OF PEACE THAT'S IN YOUR LIFE. NOW, I KNOW THAT THERE'S SOME PEOPLE WATCHING THIS THAT YOU'VE ALSO RECEIVED THE WORD OF GOD AND IT'S WORKING FOR YOU, BUT I KNOW THAT THERE'S ALSO PEOPLE THAT JUST FOR WHATEVER REASON YOU TURNED, TUNED IN AND YOU THINK THAT I MUST BE TOTALLY CRAZY FOR BELIEVING IN A THOUSAND, TWO THOUSAND, FOUR THOUSAND YEAR OLD BOOK AND THE WRITINGS AND YOU JUST THINK, MAN, HOW CRAZY ARE YOU? AGAIN, IT'S WORKING FOR ME. MY LIFE, I'M HEALTHY. I'M BLESSED, FINANCIALLY PROSPERING. I'VE GOT THINGS WORKING FOR ME. AND IT'S NOT BECAUSE OF ME. IT'S NOT BECAUSE I'M SUPERIOR IN ANY WAY. IT'S BECAUSE THE WORD OF GOD IS TRUTH, AND IF YOU WILL BELIEVE THE TRUTH, IT WILL MAKE YOU FREE. SO I GO BACK. THIS IS A PHILOSOPHY THAT YOU NEED TO HAVE, THE INFALLIBILITY OF GOD'S WORD. AND YOU NOT ONLY NEED TO ACKNOWLEDGE IT, YOU NEED TO COOPERATE WITH IT. YOU NEED TO GET IN THE WORD OF GOD AND LET THE WORD OF GOD JUST SATURATE YOU AND SOAK YOU IN THESE TRUTHS, AND IT WILL TRANSFORM YOU. A PASSAGE OF SCRIPTURE, ONE OF THE VERY FIRST SCRIPTURES THAT THE LORD EVER SHOWED ME IS ROMANS CHAPTER 12, VERSE 2, WHERE IT SAYS, AND BE NOT CONFORMED TO THIS WORLD. THE WORD CONFORM THERE MEANS TO POUR INTO THE MOLD OF. WE LIVE IN A FALLEN WORLD, AND YOU'RE GOING TO BE TRIED. YOU'RE GOING TO GO THROUGH FIERY TRIALS. THEY WILL MELT YOU, BUT YOU GET TO PICK WHICH MOLD YOU FIT INTO. HOW DO YOU PICK THAT? YOU GO BY GOD'S WORD. YOU BEGIN TO CONFORM YOUR THINKING AND YOUR ACTIONS TO GOD'S WORD. AND THEN THE FIERY trials, TRIALS OF THIS WORLD WILL MELT YOU, BUT YOU WILL FIT INTO THE MOLD OF GOD'S WORD. SO DON'T BE CONFORMED TO THIS WORLD, BUT BE TRANSFORMED. THE WORD TRANSFORM THERE IS THE GREEK WORD METAMORPHO. IT'S WHERE WE GET OUR WORD METAMORPHOSIS FROM. AND IN THE SAME WAY THAT A CATERPILLAR SPINS A COCOON AND THEN COMES OUT A BUTTERFLY, IF YOU WANT TO CHANGE FROM SOMETHING THAT'S EARTHBOUND TO SOMETHING THAT CAN FLY, SOMETHING THAT'S UGLY TO SOMETHING THAT'S BEAUTIFUL, YOU GET IT THROUGH THE TRANSFORMATION, THE RENEWING OF YOUR MIND. That's WHAT IT SAYS IN ROMANS CHAPTER 12, VERSE 2, AND THEN IT SAYS YOU WILL PROVE WHAT IS THE GOOD, THE ACCEPTABLE, AND THE PERFECT WILL OF GOD. YOU'VE GOT TO GET INTO THE WORD OF GOD AND CHANGE THE WAY YOU THINK OR CHANGE YOUR PHILOSOPHY. 
SO AGAIN, HERE'S THE SECOND THING OUT OF THIS ONE VERSE THAT I'VE POINTED OUT IN THE LAST COUPLE OF DAYS IS THAT SATAN CAME NOT WITH THE MOST POWERFUL, NOT WITH THE MOST INTIMIDATING ANIMAL, BUT WITH THE MOST SUBTLE, THE ONE THAT COULD DECEIVE, AND HE CAME AGAINST THE WORD OF GOD. IF YOU WOULD JUST GET TO WHERE THE WORD OF GOD WAS ABSOLUTE FINAL AUTHORITY IN YOUR LIFE, IT WOULD SOLVE YOUR PROBLEMS. AND I KNOW SOME OF YOU THINK THAT'S TOO SIMPLISTIC. IT'S THAT SIMPLE. IT'S NOT EASY. THE HARDEST THING YOU'LL EVER DO IS RENEW YOUR MIND. THE HARDEST THING YOU'LL EVER DO IS UNPLUG FROM THE THINKING OF THIS WORLD AND GO AGAINST THE FLOW OF ALL OF THE UNGODLINESS AND THINGS THAT ARE SAID. BUT IT IS THAT SIMPLE. IT'S THIS SIMPLE. THAT IF ALL YOU DID WAS THINK WHAT THE WORD OF GOD SAID AND INSTRUCTED YOU TO DO, ALL YOU'D EVER HAVE IS VICTORY. ALL YOU'D EVER HAVE IS THE LIFE THAT GOD HAS PROMISED YOU. IT'S THAT SIMPLE. NOT EASY, BUT IT'S THAT SIMPLE. SO HE SAID, HATH GOD SAID, AND THEN LOOK AT HOW SATAN CAME AGAINST GOD'S WORD. IN THE LAST PART OF THIS VERSE, HE SAYS, YE SHALL NOT EAT OF EVERY TREE OF THE GARDEN. YOU KNOW, I I DON'T KNOW HOW MANY TREES WERE IN THE GARDEN OF EDEN, BUT LET'S JUST SAY THAT THERE WAS A THOUSAND TREES IN THE GARDEN OF EDEN THAT THEY COULD HAVE EATEN FROM. IF SATAN WOULD HAVE COME AND SAID, HAS GOD ONLY ALLOWED YOU TO EAT FROM 999 OF THESE THOUSAND TREES IN THE GARDEN? THE VERY WAY THAT HE PHRASED THE TEMPTATION, SEE, WOULD HAVE SHOWN THAT LOOK HOW GOOD GOD IS. OUT OF A THOUSAND TREES, 999, THEY HAD TOTAL ACCESS TO. THERE WAS ONLY ONE THING IN ALL OF CREATION THAT GOD FORBID THEM. AND SATAN FOCUSED ON THE ONE THING THAT THEY DIDN'T HAVE. THIS IS HOW HE COMES AGAINST US. THEY WERE LIVING in IN A SINLESS WORLD. THERE WASN'T ANY CORRUPTION. THERE WEREN'T ANY THORNS AND THISTLES AND THINGS LIKE THAT. THE ENVIRONMENT WAS PERFECT. HOW DO YOU GET PERFECT PEOPLE TO BECOME DISSATISFIED AND REBEL AGAINST GOD? HE FOCUSED THEIR ATTENTION ON ONE THING IN THE UNIVERSE. (laughs) I JUST CAN'T OVEREMPHASIZE THIS. I DON'T KNOW HOW MANY TREES THERE WERE. I DON'T KNOW HOW MANY OTHER THINGS, BUT GOD WAS SO GOOD. THEY LIVED IN A PERFECT ENVIRONMENT. EVERYTHING WAS PERFECT. EVERYTHING WAS PERFECT. AND GOD TOLD THEM NOT TO DO ONE THING. SATAN FOCUSED ON THE ONE THING THAT THEY WERE FORBIDDEN TO DO. HE STILL DOES HIS SAME THING TODAY. THERE ARE PEOPLE THAT WILL GET FOCUSED ON THE ONE THING THAT THEY DON'T HAVE, AND THEY'LL FORGET ALL OF THE GOOD THINGS THAT GOD HAS DONE. YOU KNOW, WHEN I WAS IN THE BAPTIST CHURCH, WE USED TO SING THIS SONG, COUNT YOUR MANY BLESSINGS, NAME THEM ONE BY ONE, AND IT WILL SURPRISE YOU WHAT THE LORD HAS DONE. AND ANYWAY, THE MESSAGE OF THAT SONG WAS IS, YEAH, WE HAVE TROUBLE, BUT MAN, LOOK HOW GOOD THINGS ARE. LOOK AT ALL OF THE GOOD THINGS THAT YOU'VE GOT. DON'T FOCUS ON THE NEGATIVE THINGS THAT YOU DON'T HAVE. AND THIS IS, THIS IS THE ANTIDOTE TO WHAT SATAN WAS DOING WITH EVE HERE. HE CAME AND MADE HER FOCUS ON THE ONE THING IN HER CREATION, IN HER LIFE, THAT GOD HAD FORBIDDEN THEM TO DO. IF HE WOULD HAVE SAID, WELL, AREN'T THERE 999 TREES THAT YOU CAN EAT OF? WHY DOESN'T HE WANT YOU TO EAT OF THIS ONE? THAT WOULD HAVE DIFFUSED THIS TEMPTATION. THAT WOULD HAVE MINIMIZED THE TEMPTATION SO IT WOULD HAVE BEEN EASIER TO OVERCOME. BUT SATAN COMES AND JUST GETS US WITH TUNNEL VISION, LIKE BLINDERS ON, AND ALL WE CAN DO IS THINK ABOUT THIS ONE THING THAT'S A PROBLEM IN OUR LIFE. YOU KNOW, I ACTUALLY HAD A MAN COME FORWARD ONE TIME, AND HE WAS CRYING, AND HE HAD A HUNDRED DOLLAR NEED, AND HE NEEDED A HUNDRED DOLLARS, AND I FORGOT WHAT THE CONSEQUENCE WAS. HE WAS GOING TO LOSE HIS CAR OR LOSE HIS HOUSE OR or SOMETHING IF HE DIDN'T COME UP WITH THIS MONEY, AND HE WAS JUST DEVASTATED. I'VE GOT TO HAVE THIS MONEY. COULD YOU PLEASE PRAY WITH ME? AND YOU KNOW WHAT I DID? BECAUSE I KNEW HIM, I JUST GOT TO USING, THIS WASN'T NECESSARILY A WORD OF KNOWLEDGE. IT WAS JUST I KNEW THIS GUY. HE HAD BEEN DELIVERED OF DRUGS. HE HAD COME OUT OF A TERRIBLE LIFESTYLE. GOD HAD SAVED HIM. HE HAD JOY AND PEACE. HE HAD A GODLY WIFE. HE HAD A GODLY FAMILY AND OTHER THINGS. AND ANYWAY, I JUST STARTED REMINDING HIM OF HOW GOOD THINGS WERE. AND LOOK WHAT GOD HAD DONE. AND EVEN THOUGH HE WAS IN A SITUATION AT THAT MOMENT WAS BAD, IT JUST... PULL BACK AND LOOK AT IT IN CONTEXT OF YOUR WHOLE LIFE. AND WHEN I DID THAT, ALL OF A SUDDEN, HIS FAITH BEGAN TO RISE, AND HE BEGAN TO REALIZE GOD HAD BEEN SO FAITHFUL TO HIM. 
THAT HOW COULD HE NOT BELIEVE THAT GOD WOULD HELP HIM OVER THIS LITTLE TINY BUMP COMPARED TO SOME OF THE MOUNTAINS THAT HE HAD ALREADY OVERCOME. I HAD ANOTHER INSTANCE WHERE I WAS LISTENING TO A TAPE AND IT WAS A MAN TALKING ABOUT THAT HIS WIFE, SHE DIDN'T PLAY THE PIANO. HE WAS A PASTOR OF A CHURCH AND HIS WIFE DIDN'T PLAY THE PIANO. SHE DIDN'T TEACH SUNDAY SCHOOL. SHE DIDN'T DO THE THINGS THAT A TYPICAL MINISTER'S WIFE DID. AND HE GOT TO THINKING THAT MAYBE THAT'S THE REASON HIS CHURCH DIDN'T GROW IS BECAUSE HIS WIFE WASN'T THE CHURCH PIANIST. SHE DIDN'T TEACH A SUNDAY SCHOOL CLASS. SHE DIDN'T DO THESE THINGS. AND HE ACTUALLY GOT TO A PLACE TO WHERE HE WAS PRAYING AND ASKING GOD TO GRANT HIM THE LIBERTY TO GET A DIVORCE AND MARRY SOMEBODY ELSE WHO COULD BE A GREATER ASSET TO HIM IN THE MINISTRY. AND HE KNEW WHEN HE GOT TO THAT POINT, HE KNEW THAT THAT WAS WRONG. HE KNEW THAT THIS WASN'T WHAT GOD WANTED HIM TO DO. AND SO HE JUST CRIED OUT AND HE SAYS, GOD, I NEED HELP. HOW DO I HANDLE THE FACT THAT MY WIFE DOESN'T DO THIS AND DOESN'T DO THIS? AND, and HE JUST ASKED GOD FOR HELP. AND THE LORD SPOKE TO HIM AND HE SAYS, I WANT YOU FOR 30 DAYS TO QUIT ASKING ME TO CHANGE YOUR WIFE AND TO MAKE HER LIKE THIS AND TO MAKE HER DO THIS AND THIS AND THIS. AND INSTEAD OF ASKING ME FOR ANYTHING FOR YOUR WIFE, I WANT YOU TO SPEND 30 DAYS JUST THANKING ME FOR SOMETHING ABOUT HER. EVERY DAY, THANK ME FOR SOMETHING ABOUT YOUR WIFE. AND HE SAID THAT THE VERY FIRST DAY, HE COULDN'T THINK OF ANYTHING GOOD. AND HE HAD TO SAY, GOD, YOU'RE GOING TO HAVE TO SHOW ME SOMETHING GOOD ABOUT MY WIFE. HE COULDN'T SEE ANYTHING GOOD. AND SO THE LORD SPOKE TO HIM AND HE SAYS, WELL, SHE'S BEEN WITH YOU FOR, I FORGET HOW MANY YEARS, ABOUT LIKE 30 YEARS OR SOMETHING. AND SHE'S BEEN FAITHFUL TO YOU AND SHE NEVER COMMITTED ADULTERY ON YOU. HOW WOULD THAT HAVE AFFECTED YOUR MINISTRY IF YOUR WIFE WOULD HAVE BEEN OUT LIVING IN ADULTERY? AND HE SAID, WELL, IT WOULD HAVE BEEN DEVASTATING. SO HE STARTED THANKING GOD THAT HIS WIFE HAD BEEN FAITHFUL TO HIM FOR ALL OF THOSE YEARS. THEN THE SECOND DAY, HE, he HAD TO ASK GOD AGAIN, WELL, HELP ME TO FIND SOMETHING ELSE GOOD ABOUT HER. AND THE LORD SPOKE TO HIM AND SAID, SHE'S HELPED RAISE YOUR KIDS AND SHE LOVED YOUR KIDS AND SHE'S BEEN A GOOD MOTHER AND SHE TOOK CARE OF YOUR KIDS. AND WHILE YOU WERE TRAVELING AND MINISTERING, SHE WAS RUNNING THE HOUSE. AND HE BEGAN TO START THANKING GOD FOR THAT. AND THEN EVERY DAY FOR A WHOLE MONTH, HE JUST FOUND SOMETHING TO THANK GOD ABOUT HIS WIFE FOR. AND AT THE END OF 30 DAYS, HE HAD FALLEN IN LOVE WITH HIS WIFE ALL OVER AGAIN. AND HE WAS RECOGNIZING HOW GODLY SHE WAS. MAYBE THERE WERE SOME THINGS SHE DIDN'T DO, BUT MAN, SHE WAS GODLY IN SO MANY WAYS. AND THIS MAN WAS JUST REPENTING AND SAYING, THANK YOU, THANK YOU, THANK YOU, FATHER, FOR SUCH A GODLY WIFE. SEE, THAT'S THE PRINCIPLE THAT I'M TALKING ABOUT RIGHT HERE. SATAN DIDN'T COME SAYING, LOOK AT THE GOODNESS OF GOD. LOOK AT ALL OF THE TREES. That he's, ISN'T THIS FRUIT GREAT? MAN, THAT IS THE BEST FRUIT OVER HERE. He, IF HE WOULD HAVE POINTED OUT HOW GOOD EVERYTHING WAS AND THEN SAY, BUT THERE'S ONE THING THAT GOD COMMANDED YOU NOT TO DO, THAT WOULD HAVE JUST TAKEN ALL OF THE TEETH OUT OF THIS TEMPTATION. BUT INSTEAD, HE DIDN'T ACKNOWLEDGE ANYTHING GOOD. HE JUST FOCUSED ON THE BAD. AND SEE, THIS IS A PHILOSOPHY, A NEGATIVE PHILOSOPHY THAT MOST PEOPLE HAVE. WE ARE IN A FALLEN WORLD THAT DOESN'T TELL YOU ABOUT THE THOUSANDS OF PLANES THAT LAND SAFELY. THEY DON'T TELL YOU ABOUT ALL OF THE BABIES THAT WERE BORN AND ARE TOTALLY HEALTHY. THEY'LL TELL YOU ABOUT THE ONES THAT ARE SICK. THEY'LL TELL YOU ABOUT EVERY ROTTEN THING. BAD NEWS SELLS. THEY DON'T TELL YOU ABOUT THE GOOD STUFF. THEY ONLY TELL YOU THE NEGATIVE. WE HAVE BEEN CONDITIONED to, TO LOOK FOR THE NEGATIVE, TO GRAVITATE TOWARDS THE NEGATIVE. AND BECAUSE OF IT, PEOPLE JUST, AGAIN, MAGNIFY THE NEGATIVE. YOUR MIND IS LIKE A MAGNIFYING GLASS OR LIKE A PAIR OF BINOCULARS OR A MICROSCOPE. WHATEVER YOU FOCUS YOUR ATTENTION ON, IT JUST GETS BIGGER AND BIGGER AND BIGGER AND BIGGER. AND PEOPLE WILL FOCUS THEIR ATTENTION ON WHAT THEY DON'T HAVE INSTEAD OF WHAT THEY DO HAVE. I REMEMBER MY OLDEST SON. WE SENT HIM ON A MISSIONS TRIP WHEN HE WAS JUST 14 OR 15 YEARS OLD, AND HE WENT TO THE SOVIET UNION. THIS WAS BACK BEFORE, uh, YOU KNOW, the, THE SOVIET UNION WAS DISBANDED. THE BERLIN WALL CAME DOWN. AND HE WENT OVER THERE, AND HE SAW THE POVERTY. HE SAW THE OPPRESSION. HE SAW THE WAY THAT PEOPLE LIVED UNDER THIS, this DICTATORSHIP AND THINGS LIKE THAT. AND HE LITERALLY, WHEN HE CAME BACK, HE GOT OFF OF THE PLANE AND HE KISSED THE GROUND. AND I TELL YOU, this, THIS IS SOMETHING THAT A LOT OF PEOPLE MISS. THEY SIT THERE AND they, THEY FOCUS ON, YOU KNOW, ALL OF THE COMMERCIALS ON THE TELEVISION ARE TELLING YOU WHAT YOU DON'T HAVE AND YOU CAN'T BE HAPPY UNTIL YOU GET THIS. AND THEY FOCUS ON WHAT YOU DON'T HAVE AND THEY BUILD LUST IN YOU AND A DESIRE FOR MORE. THEY NEVER MAKE YOU APPRECIATE
They, they prey off of this desire for more and this lust for more, and they just amplify it. But, you know, the Scripture says that we should enter into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. It says over in Philippians chapter 4, with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God. That doesn't deny the fact that we have things that we need, but every time you come before God, you ought to start thanking Him for how good it is. Thank God it's as good as it is. You know, a good friend of mine, Bob Nichols, his daughter had a car wreck and, and hit her head, and at first it didn't look like there was anything, but then she started having headaches, and eventually she had a seizure, and I forget the amount of time now, but it's been over 20 years, I think, that she's basically in a vegetative state. The doctors say she doesn't have any brain waves, and yet every once in a while she'll say some words, she can stand up and talk, and she's had to have 24-hour care uh, for over two decades. And I was preaching along these lines of being thankful and praise God for what we've had. Yes, there's things that we need, but praise God, things are as good as they are. And I was in the middle of that message. It was at a minister's conference, and Pastor Bob just stood up and threw his Bible on the floor, and he says, I've had all of this I can take. I've got to just start thanking God for how good things are. And he started praising God for all kinds of things. Yes, he had a terrible situation in his own home with his daughter, but man, he also had a lot of good things, and he was just so thankful. He started praising God, and people in that meeting knew his situation. When they saw how he was praising God and thanking God, even though he had a terrible situation, in comparison, their problems were minor. We started having ministers all over the place fall on their knees and repent and say, God, forgive me for not being thankful for what I've... Welcome to our Tuesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today, I'm continuing a series that I started last week talking about Christian philosophy. This is a 280-page book that I wrote decades ago, and the first half of this book is about what I've already covered last week and then yesterday's program. And then starting tomorrow, the second half of this book is kind of the application of these truths about the way you think. And I specifically talk about creation versus evolution, abortion, and homosexuality. And so this is different than most of my books. It's kind of a reference book. And this actually is a precursor to the entire uh, biblical worldview series that I now have. We have four biblical worldview sets out that deal with foundational truths which covers some of these things. And then we also deal with uh, sexuality and how that the Bible, uh, biblical view of sexuality is, one on racism and one on socialism. And so that's all good. This is just a basic, real quick summary of some of the charts and pictures that I have in this book. We're offering this little pamphlet as a freebie. This book, we're asking for a donation of any amount uh, towards that. And as I said, this is now into my second week of teaching. I've already covered so much material that I can't go back and summarize all of this, but philosophy is talking about not just individual thoughts, but a way of thinking. There are many Christians that know that by the stripes of Jesus they're healed, and so they will think about healing, but it hasn't changed their whole outlook. They still see themselves sick, and yet they're praying for healing. You aren't going to get that. As the person thinks in their heart, so are they. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7, as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. So the way you think, talking about your overall view is how your life is going. And you can't pray and get answers that are contrary to the way that you're thinking. Man, those are big, big statements. I've been using the last few days as an example the way that Satan came against Eve he first of all entered into the most subtle animal, not the biggest, not the strongest, not one that could intimidate or force because he had no power to force Eve and Adam to do anything. He had to come and deceive them. Same thing with us. He has no force, no power to force anything upon us. Everything has to come through deception. And the first way he tried to get them to sin against God was to say, hath God said he challenged the Word of God. And I've spent days explaining these things, but you have to have a philosophy that establishes God's Word is absolute, 
final total authority in your life. And there are very, very, very few Christians that have made that decision. Most people look at the Bible as something that they do to kind of just satisfy some desire that they have to know God or maybe pay an obligation. It's their duty to do it. But they don't commit them lives to it. They don't base their life on the Word of God. You have to have a philosophy that God said it, that's it. He's God. I'm not. I'm not going to question it. And then the ne next thing I talked about, he pointed out the one thing in creation that God didn't allow them to do. He didn't talk about all of the good things. And this is another philosophy that Christians need to have. Instead of focusing on what we don't have, instead of focusing on all of the negatives, we need to focus on the positives. Now, that doesn't mean that you bury your head in the sand and refuse to acknowledge that there's a problem. Sometimes you have to deal with problems head on, but you always need to put them into their proper perspective. You know, there's a passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 where Paul... Let me just turn over and read this because I'm not sure I'll quote it exactly right, but 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the apostle Paul was speaking and he said in verse 17, "...for our light affliction which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal." Boy, there's a lot in these verses. But Paul said, our light affliction. And some people think, well, that's a problem. Paul just didn't have my problems. He just had a light affliction. Paul lists what his problems were over in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And if you were to read it, it was being shipwrecked. It was being beaten with rods, beaten with whips, in stocks, uh, in hunger and thirst, shipwrecked, a night and a day in the deep. Uh, he said he had been persecuted more than anybody else right here in this very chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And yet he called it just a light affliction not because it was actually light, but because of the way he put it into its proper perspective. He put it into the light of eternity. And he said in verse 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal or temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So see, this is a philosophy, a mindset. He saw everything in the light of eternity. And he said over in Romans chapter 8, I think it's verse 18, that the sufferings of this present world are not even worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now, see, he wasn't denying that there were sufferings, but he put it into co the context. Compared to eternity, this life is just like the snap of a finger. Eternity is forever. And whatever we suffer down here is going to be nothing in compared to eternity. See, if you could just have a mindset like this, people look at things and they say, but I've been suffering for a week. Well, man, what's a week in, in the context of an entire life? Or what's a week in the context of an entire eternity? He says the way that he was able to shrink it down to where it's just a small thing, it's a light affliction, is because he put it into the light of eternity. You know, I've used this example before, but it's a great example that there was a woman who I talked to one time who had tried to kill herself because she was in either her third or fourth marriage and her husband had said he was going to divorce her and she just couldn't go through another divorce. So she attempted suicide. And anyway, I saw her the day after she was released from the hospital. It was her first day back at work. And I spoke at this business and then the boss allowed people to come back into a break room. So I